Hi, everybody. Could you join me? Uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, not good morning. Um, I call this meeting to order. A couple of things. Paul is going to, Paul Van Cott's going to join us this afternoon for, as, as sitting as council, and tomorrow Sarah will be here. First, I'm going to say happy Valentine's Day. So, I'm wearing a little pink today. So, uh, um, and I welcome everybody back. We had no January meeting. It seems a little odd to say Happy New Year and did you have a good holiday? It seems so long ago. But, uh, but anyway, welcome back. It's good to be here. I hope everybody did have a good holiday. Um, all right, um, got a busy day, so why don't we just get right into it and start with any public comment today? None. Okay. Uh, then let's approve our minutes from December 13th and 14th. Does anybody have it? Okay, motion. Second for Dan. Any comments, questions, changes? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, those are passed. Thank you. Any recusals today? Seeing none. Uh, need for Executive session? None. Good. Terry? Good afternoon. So easy to say good morning to all of you. <laughs> it's sort of a bit of a tradition that we have. And happy Valentine's Day. And as Karen said, this is the first meeting of the new year. So since we were last here in December, we've continued to experience the range of winter. We're going on about four months now, and we're right between a storm that we had midweek and one for tomorrow. So this is a good day. It's blue sky out there. It's sunny. Um, it's great to be here. Weather, obviously, all across the country from what we're continuing to see with um, this winter. I am pleased to say that 90% of the heat that you're feeling in terms of this building is coming from that biomass unit out there. <laughs> Yay. Um, we're still finalizing the details in terms of the, the heating into the state police, but it's my understanding that DEC and the park agency have been benefiting which is great, 90%. So varies, again, depending on if we go colder, et cetera, in terms of the propane use here. Um, but it is working, and we are putting together details in terms of public viewing. I thought you said it was working too well. Didn't you complain to me you were a little warm the other day? Uh, <laughs> yeah, th that's, that's more zones in the building as opposed to the biomass itself. <laughs> And Happy New Year with it being February and coming into the middle of February and President's Weekend. The start of the year always includes for all the staff a compilation of division data and reporting. Um, for this month's mailing, we released the program division reports for November and December, so you're seeing data through the end of the year la um, last year. And staff are finalizing um, the annual report material for the programs, which will be um, linked to the 2018 annual report that Keith McKeever is finalizing. And we have that planned for distribution in March. And um, with the benefits of email, I mean, we're going to be looking at continuing to use that in terms of a distribution um, in the, in the region and around the state in terms of um, having that be made available to people. So we'll have that uh, next month. We're pleased um, today to have the time with you to present the Frontier Town Project. Having been at the grand opening this past fall, which was tremendous, it's been a pleasure to work with the, the department, um, the towns, and to see the excitement of the campground and the plans for an upcoming full season this year. So you'll be hearing more about that this afternoon. 
<laughs> um, following the commentary that we heard throughout last year on the impacts of climate change, intergovernmental bodies, the panel, UN scientists, etc., we know it's vital to have uh, three professors from Paul Smith's College with us today. We're going to have Dr. Celia Evans, Dr. Kurt Steger, and Dr. Leanne Sporns. And Given everything that we've been hearing, it'll be so good to hear an overview of their research and what has been learned about the impacts of climate change in the Adirondacks, and to hear from local scientists that are looking at analyzing and can provide this perspective. Um, we know from the reports and everything that we were hearing in 2008, and obviously prior, that without um, changes, there will be significant damages to our economy environment and human health projected to be in the hundreds of billions. So hearing that in relation to um, what the science is telling us here in the Adirondacks, I think is going to be a really informative afternoon for us, providing an important perspective of everything that we do. Tomorrow morning, we're going to conclude the uh, presentations with a staff presentation on the Saranac Lake Wild Forest UMB and the board's action to determine Adirondack Park State Land Master Plan uh, conformance. In addition to working with the department to finalize the SLWF um, UMP, staff have been very busy with reviewing the more than 200 letters that we received during the public comment period that ended on February 1st for the ski trail guidance, something that you moved out to public comment in December. Um, staff are also working on the primitive tent site guidance and reviewing material with the department on the Hammond Pond UMP, all of which will be scheduled at a future um, meeting or meetings. Uh, the planning division staff are certainly looking forward to Rick Weber's transition to the division as deputy director of planning effective March 1st. And during these past number of weeks, uh, Rick has become more active in the division, still with that sense of being planted in regulatory programs, knowing that, that this is a transition period. And we know that that will soon change. And he will then be providing future planning division reports. And I won't be commenting on those things in what, the way I just have now. So. In a larger effort throughout the agency, staff have been involved in strategic planning, which will continue to be a focus of ours in 2019. We have real momentum underway at this point in terms of addressing a strategic <coughs> goal for regulatory processes for more timely and efficient regulatory determinations that will continue to provide the necessary resource and environmental protections. Rick Weber and Paul Van Cott assisted with planning um, discussions at the end of 2018. It was like November going into the end of the year with staff from RAS, legal, the enforcement and regulatory program. So all the staff had an opportunity to talk about um, these planning goals. And, and through that, we gathered ideas. Uh, we used a, an appreciative inquiry approach to organizational change. And by that, I'm saying that the questions were focused on what is right in what we do in our processes and how do we look at what's right um, in the work in, environment in terms of that being an opportunity to examine the agency's core strengths from a whole systems approach. So um, that just generated really good ideas um, that we look forward to sharing in more detail in the future about the work objectives, ideas that include um, early site visits and the context of the agency's um, content of the agency's final permits. And these will be ongoing discussions in 2019, and we look forward to working with our chair and with the board as these ideas continue to emerge. In other business, it's been really busy in um, as we continue to address staffing opportunities within the agency. In mid-December 2018, the agency received approval from the um, Civil Service for an additional EPS-3 position here um, in Raybrook, which was followed by a canvas for applicants. And I just wanted to comment on what this new position is. Um, we worked on it for a long time to receive it, the authorization from civil service. We currently have one EPS3 um, position in the uh, 
at the agency which Colleen uh, Parker is in, and this new position is in no way duplicative of that. Um, we'll now have the two positions. This new position will be um, also housed in the Regulatory Programs Division and involve management of the agency's regulatory permitting and enforcement needs through a level of coordination between regulatory programs, legal, RAS and the planning divisions. We're envisioning it as a liaison position that will assist with project preparations, reviews, training, troubleshooting across the agency. It was authorized by civil service to include the move of the EPS-1 and EPS-2 staffs that are in enforcement to be under the umbrella of the regulatory programs division. So enforcement staff will continue their current workload regarding enforcement and related regulatory matters. That's been a real success to what we've done here within the agency in terms of the kind of training that we provide to staff from the beginning when they start here, allowing for under, you know, for them to be involved in both areas. So now this is recognizing that and building on that. So in this context, enforcement staff will use legal services in a manner that's similar to other divisions within the agency. They'll request assignments as needed, which is what the other divisions all do when they need an attorney involvement, whether it be with a project or looking at a technical issue or a policy-related matter. So that, that requesting of, of assignments will be um, available to them, much like um, other divisions. And what will we envision that they'll be asked? for. They'll be asking for input um, regarding enforcement reviews, settlement agreements, notice of apparent violations, all the things that we've routinely have done up to now in terms of how we engage with our legal staff. Um, we also recognize that the enforcement committee will continue to operate as a separate committee with member um, Lucy um, chairing it. Um, and they will provide oversight to the agency's enforcement actions. And the enforcement committee will continue to receive the reports accounting for the work within the division, much like you saw at the end of um, for no November and December. That will continue. So after working a long time to have this position, um, we're excited um, because it's going to allow a level of coordination that I think is really going to build on and support the kind of planning work um, that we're doing. So I'd like to talk about in terms of staffing and what we've, um, in, in terms of who we're looking at and what the opportunities that we have. Um, and it is with great pleasure today that I announce the appointment of John Berth to the a position of Environmental Program Specialist 3. He assume, assumed his new position on February 7th. He's been with the agency since August of 2007 when he began as an Environmental Program Specialist 1 and then in March 2010 as an environmental program specialist too. He came to the agency with a Master of Professional Studies in Natural Resource Management from SUNY ESF and a bachelor's from Union College. Previous work experience prior to joining us here um, included work at Cornell Cooperative Extension in Oswego County, which had him involved in personnel management and public outreach. Please join me in welcoming him to this new position as we look forward to his continued contributions to the agency. I look forward to working with both um, Colleen Parker and John, and with all the division staff, following Rick's complete dis uh, transition to planning again on March 1st, even though at times I've slipped and said May. It's really March. I told you May. I know. That's a slip. That's a slip. It's really. It's March 1st. So also included on today's agenda, and Rick's going to present this to you, 
um, in regulatory programs because that's where the action will be needed. But I just wanted to comment on it. And that has to do with the delegation of signing authority for permits, uh, notices of incomplete permit applications, NIPAs, and project completion notices. Um, Rick will note that in the absence or unavailability of the deputy director in regulatory programs or of me, um, we are proposing to have John Berth and Colleen Parker authorized to sign permits in these notices of completion and incompletion. Again, Rick will discuss this in committee where you, we request um, your consideration of an authorizing resolution. We added language about the unavailability because we realized that there may be times where me or the deputy are in the building, but in a meeting or on a call, and we're looking at a timeline, time clock requirement of getting something out where it needs to, to move immediately. So, um, and most importantly, we're also proposing the authorization based on the upcoming staffing transition. Um, when Rick does move um, to be deputy director planning on March 1st, and has his office downstairs and that transition is complete, um, he will not be in the same position of um, signing and um, that he obviously is in now. So just wanted to make that clear and we'll be talking about that in a little bit. In other staffing news, I have another staffing announcement today um, with the appointment of Christian Blue, who's there in the back, to the position of Environmental Program Specialist 1 trainee. He assumed his new position on January 24th. He came to the agency with experience from the Adirondack Watershed Institute. He's also worked at Mountain Lake Academy in Lake Placid as a technology teacher. He has experience in working with the public, collecting environmental data in the, um, in the field, and learning ways to protect our waterways throughout the Adirondack Park. He holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Natural Resources st Sustainability with a minor in Geographic Information Systems from Paul Smith's College. And we look forward to his contributions to the agency and the state of New York. And please join me in welcoming him to the APA. It isn't usual that I have three staffing announcements to make, <laughs> but that is today. I have three staffing announcements to make. Um, and today I'm going to be making an announcement for a person who actually isn't here in the building with us, um, but who will be joining us as counsel to the Adirondack Park Agency. Effective March 21st, Christopher Cooper will assume his new position here as counsel. March 21st, that's a Monday. Um, he comes to the agency from the Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York. He has also owned his own law practice, worked with Patterson, Belknap, Webb, and Tyler, and with the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory. He has experience in working in the public and private sectors and on numerous boards. He joins the agency with a strong foundation in leadership and management. He brings an understanding of the workings of the Adirondack Park, having served as an attorney for the town of Fine for six years. He's a resident um, in Star Lake. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Marine Engineering Systems from the United States Merchant Marine Academy, where he also served in the Merchant Marine Reserve as a lieutenant for 10 years. He earned his Juris Doctor from New York University School of Law with a concentration in administrative, environmental, and business law. We look forward to his contributions to the agency beginning on March 25th, to his first board meeting here with you on August 18th, 19th, excuse me, April 18th, 19th, thank you, good catch. <laughs> Good catch. Not in December yet. Um, and of course, he will be here to have his first local government day in early April. And so we can. 
Are you trying to rush your retirement? Is that what you're doing? Move all this stuff? Yeah, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, please join me in welcoming Chris Cooper. We can do that again when he joins us here. And, and he's with us in the report. <laughs> Okay, in conclusion of my early afternoon remarks, I welcome any questions you may have. I just like to mention that um, that what Terry was talking about is is really uh, um, pretty significant because we're reorganizing the divisions, and while we may not actually see some of those results here. Uh, um, we will feel them because it will hopefully make things much more efficient and run a little more smoothly and um, and for all for all the good the good reasons that you do these kind of things so i'm I'm very pleased and I thank you as well as Elaine and everybody else who had a hand in making this happen but but this is um, a reorganization that is a long time coming and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the results on on the other side but um, it, I think it's a really good move. So it, it's pretty significant. I think we have the ability to have real synergy with what we've been seeing and tremendous ability with our staff. Um, so it's going to be a win-win. And the only other thing I'll mention is just in terms of climate change, I'm looking forward to this presentation today because at this, this week in Albany, uh, Peter, you were there, correct? Cli there was a climate change day. And I'm very curious to see how, if there is any interaction between what Paul Smith is doing and what the state is looking to do and, and a lot of the other groups that are, and particularly pushing forward on this climate change bill uh, that, it, that is um, being proposed. And, and also just really w what outreach they're doing, education and awareness. Because again, I think that all, part of all of this has got to be uh, um, a component, has to be education and awareness of climate change. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what their response may be on, on, on those topics. Thank you, Terry, very much. Lots going on. Okay, I'm going to have a, I need a motion to adjourn into committees, please. I'll make that motion. Dan, may I have a second? Chad, all those in favor? Aye. All right. Great. So. We're starting with reg programs. Dan, floor yep. is yours. Thank you. Regular prairie programs will come to order. Um, we'll begin with uh, the need for a motion to approve the uh, draft committee meet, uh, minutes of the December 18th meeting from the committee. Moved by Art. Second. Second. Second by John. Discussion, corrections at all? Hearing none. Motions passed. All in favor? Good. Thanks. And uh, next, um, we'll have our uh, report from Rick. Thanks, Rick. So, good afternoon. Um, I, <laughs> it, um, just a few talking points about uh, the work of the Regulatory Programs Committee. Uh, or not the committee, but the division over the last couple of months. And I will, from the high profile report, just really point out one item, which is that variances, you know, summarizing the uh, variances that are listed in the report, there are at this point 23 variance requests that are under consideration. Six of those are actual applications, and 17 of them are in pre application at this point. And just as an interesting point, um, 13 of these, uh, or about 60% of them, are all expansions of, of single fa existing SFDs in, in the shoreline setback. So that is what we had always felt was the majority of the work, and it's, that number is bearing out at this point. Um, there are other variances that are under request in this, which include retaining walls um, and some new s single family dwellings in, in uh, um, the shoreline setback as well. So um, that's all that I was going to pull from the high profile report. Um, I don't know if there are any questions on any of the status um, materials or the um, uh, high profile report before moving on to a uh, a few other items. 
Um, okay. Seeing none at this point, then I, I, I do want to bring to your attention um, Project 2018-184, which is on the high-profile report. Um, it's the Burkhart variance. And I'm bringing this to your attention because it is one that staff believes meets the criteria established in the uh, uh, agency's resolution delegating certain responsibilities, the Del Res, um, for staff to authorize as a minor variance. Since the timing of staff's recommendation was not identified in the high profile report, I'm bringing it to your attention at this point. Um, and if upon hearing no objection, staff would proceed with authorizing that um, minor variance. Uh, the variance was uh, one of the first to be uh, reviewed under the new variance application with Appendix A. And uh, initial feedback from the applicant was that it was a very clear and positive, uh, you know, there was a good clear understanding of what the process was and that the effort that's been put into that uh, application, I think, is bearing fruit. Um, the application was received in November 12th. We held a 576.6 um, hearing, which is um, a hearing where uh, special procedures applicable to certain variance applications can be um, uh, applied um, when the deputy director believes the grounds for the variance clearly exists. It can be a simpler format, and we implemented that for the first time at this, um, in recent uh, practice. And um, the environmental program specialist went to the meeting alone to simply hear if there were any objections to the variance. It was scheduled and held in the town. Um, no one attended other than the authorized rep, I believe, and there were no comments. So um, that occurred um, on February 11th. The variance site is um, a 0.4 acre lot. Uh, with 80 feet of shoreline and moderate intensity use. And there was a new on-site wastewater treatment system installed outside the 100-foot setback in 2014. Um, the variance request now involves the replacement of an existing 1,035-square-foot uh, single-family dwelling constructed on the, uh, actually on the shoreline of Cranberry Lake um, in 1925 with a new 1,247 square foot dwelling um, approximately in the same location, uh, resulting in an increase in overall height of the structure by four feet. That's actually what the variance request is for. There is no overall increase in the width. It's actually being moved four feet back from the uh, um, mean high watermark and the expansion of the footprint is actually less than 250 square feet to the rear. So um, it, the only request that is um, for a variance is for the four foot increase in height. And uh, so I wa did want to bring that to your attention and it is staff's recommendation to proceed with that under the delegated, uh, uh, under the Del Res. Um, uh, another th item that I did want to bring to your attention was that uh, we did issue a, uh, an emergency order to the New York State DOT um, on January uh, 31st. Agency staff received a request from DOT for an emergency authorization under the new regulations um, to stabilize a failing retaining wall uh, supporting New York State Route 9N near Hague to the south of the Hague. Um, an emergency certificate upon reviewing the information that was provided by the DOT was um, issued the following day. Um, DOT staff notified the agency that a section of the existing stone masonry wall that supports the road and the road shoulder had failed and actually was there was debris in the lake. Um, and because of that, they had to close one of the lanes of the highway. It was a, a, a sudden and um, immediate threat to life and property. Um, and uh, as a result, the 
they, they closed the road uh, to one lane. The uh, DOT now intends to fully close the road section with a detour for the duration of the reconstruction work and they intend to build basically a, a shoulder pile lag wall behind the existing stone wall um, to um, buttress what is failing and then build the uh, rebuild the uh, stone wall in, in place and um, the the detour will be required as the road is fully closed from February 25th um, to May 23rd at its longest but it may be shorter than that but that's what they've um, said at this point um, it's a hundred foot long section of of wall that needs to be repaired um, once it's completed it'll be backfilled and the shoulder and guide rail and travel lane will be restored to allow two-lane traffic uh, to commence um, and the uh, proposal the DOT is um, very familiar with what are the necessary erosion and sediment control practices that need to be done for this type of work and it's part of their work um, I just did want to bring to your attention that we did issue that um, on the first of this month um, and that process with a template um, and a review process that we had worked um, very quickly and that's the intent of trying to be responsive to an emergency situation um, so um, this is also before getting into talking about the del res or not the del res but the delegation of, of, of signatures for permits um, I would like to just say this is my last meeting here as the uh, deputy director of regulatory programs and I would just like to say that I really have enjoyed working for this committee and with agency staff um, for the last eight and a half years it was surprising to me when I looked at it um, I, I do believe change will be good for the agency for the division and and for me I'm looking forward to the new challenges and opportunities in the planning division as well um, the operation of the regulatory programs division is in excellent hands welcome John and Colleen I know that this is going to work very well um, as Terry has mentioned you know both the reorganization and the uh, strategic planning efforts this is actually a very exciting time to be focusing on and looking at regulatory um, process and how do we do a better job of improving in qual the environmental review as well as being responsive in a timely and efficient manner both are important and um, uh, this is going some very good things are going to happen from this I I'm seeing it as I'm leaving there I've been involved in some of what's beginning to happen and it's it's really going to take hold it's gonna it's gonna be an exciting time um, and and to that end, I also just would like to reiter, re reiterate something that I hear from this this board often at the end of every meeting about the staff work and um, The review teams comprised of environmental pro program specialists, RAS, local government services, planning and legal staff as needed for each one of the individual reviews that may be going on, um, provide outstanding professional service to the public, both the project sponsors and to the people of the state for the administration of the act. Um, it's not an easy job and staff do it um, with great respect thoroughness and timeliness and um, if there's anything that I am going to miss out of this it's the uh, kind of odd sense of humor at times um, about uh, that's applied while managing a very hard workload um, in the face of a 15-day clock and uh, it's tremendous work so getting to my exiting and the need to talk about uh, delegation you did receive um, you should have received in in your packet a memo from Sarah to Terry just talking about the process of delegation and then an actual 
um, memorandum from Terry to um, both Colleen and John uh, to um, re receive authority to um, um, sign um, the transactional documents that are necessary for the review of projects under tight timelines at, 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 at times. Um, and as Terry has noted in her remarks, uh, staff are asking that the board delegate the authority yeah. Yeah, of the one. deputy director of regulatory programs to sign permits and notices of completion and incompletion yeah. to the two environmental program specialist threes in the division held by Colleen and John. Um, this delegation will only apply if the executive director or the deputy director of regulatory programs are absent or unavailable. And since the seat will not be um, filled, it will be a vacancy for the deputy director regulatory programs, um, that responsibility would solely fall on Terry to sign permits unless a delegation letter like this is um, granted at this point. Um, in order to make this limited delegation possible, legal has provided a background memorandum, the one I just referred to, in a draft delegation memorandum that is part of your mailing package. Um, before we move into the presentation on the project itself at this point uh, for Frontier Town, um, agency staff ask that the uh, regulatory programs committee consider recommendation of the proposed delegation to the agency board through adoption of a motion <laughs> to that effect. All right. So at this time, um, uh, I'll ask the committee to, if they're all in favor of moving this to the full board for approval. Motion. Motion. Yes. From the committee. The um, new copy that was handed out today at the table had the wrong date on it. Um, it says as delegated by the agency board on February 14th. That should, should be, be February 15th. Correct. And the new copy did have the word unavailability put into it. Right. Okay. So I just, uh, yeah. No, that's not the right Absence point. or unavailability. That one's, that one's not right. The one that was... It's on the table. It's on the table. It's this one. Disregard what was in your package, and it's what... There's a one page that was given to you today. So we added, they added the word you or unavailability of the deputy director, but also the date is February 14th. It should be February 15th. So with Correct. those couple of changes, you can go ahead and... But the committee should... Is voting now to move to the full board. Yes. We have a motion. John, second. All, right. all in favor? Are you taking comments on Dan at all, or all right. I, I just had a question for clarification because this takes an act of the board to make this happen. Does it also take an act of the board to undo it? I mean, the, who writes this letter? It refers mm -hmm. to should this their authority be removed? The, it makes reference to authority being. The, Temporary. It all it all starts in the APA Act, where the agency has the authority to delegate all of its duties, um, and then we have the delegation resolution. Um, and so this is really uh, for the interim purpose of uh, signature authority. Um, and uh, I, I think actually what we anticipate, hopefully over the next several months. We'll be working to uh, bring this into the formal delegation resolution and clean up some of the uh, delegation language that's in there and maybe uh, have some new ideas that are part of that. Yeah. All right, so I guess in my just to, to uh, go a little further, this at the end of this letter it says this authority will continue until you are given written dis uh, direction to the contrary. Yeah. I just come from Terry. that would come from Terry and doesn't require any board action beyond this. We not need to come okay. back to the Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passed to move to the full board tomorrow. 
Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, now we'll hear Project P 2018 218 uh, by area. And this is the uh, Frontier Town Project DEC. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah. Okay. So, as you've just heard, I'm presenting a project that actually has two numbers just to make it more interesting and complex. Uh, 2017-216A, an amendment of the previous permit order, as well as the new number 2018-218. And it's for the phase three trail enhancement um, at the Frontier Town Campground, equestrian and day use area, which includes additional trail improvements, a timber footbridge, a stone stairway, and four viewpoints. The New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is the applicant, and the landowners are the town of North Hudson and Essex County. And in the audience, on behalf of DEC, we have Michelle Crew. And I've also noticed that uh, retired town supervisor from North Hudson, Ron Moore, is also here today. And there are others watching via webcast. Who's the lights person? Thank you, Colleen. <laughs> so back at the January meeting last year, 2018, you voted to issue permit and order 2017-216 for this Frontier Town Campground equestrian and day use area. And that authorization covered phase one and phase two of the project. So phase one has been substantially completed, and that includes this uh, equestrian camping area and the recycling buildings in that oval as well. It includes two day use areas. The one closer to the road here is open year round and then the one more interior to the campground we, we call the summer day use area since they don't plow that road in the winter. That'll just be summer use. Also completed with phase one are the main entrance road Keep losing the mouse here. The main entrance road and the ticket booth. And the maintenance road over here and buildings alongside it that include the caretaker's cabin, staff cabin, maintenance garage, firewood shed, and water pump building. So again, that's substantially completed with phase one. Phase two is underway, um, but will be completed hopefully this spring. And that includes the RV and trailer camping area, that red oval, and this other red oval, the tent camping area. So if, if you recall, the trail plan wasn't quite ready in January of last year when this project was before you. So there was a permit condition requiring that agency staff review and approve the trail plan before the trails were constructed. And staff did that, and we issued a letter of permit compliance for phase one and phase two of the trail plan last February 2018. The phase one and two trails are already or nearly constructed. They are the gray, well, they're these first four colors here, gray, purple, blue, and pink. The gray and blue lines are accessible <coughs> trails so a lot of blue here, and his is the gray. Those are accessible trails. And the purple and pink lines are non-accessible trails due to steep slopes or stairways. So some here, a little section down here. So those are already or nearly constructed. And that brings us up to the present. So we now have a proposal, which is before you today, is for phase three of the trail plan. So those are the areas circled in black on this map. And we're bringing the phase three trail improvements to you and seeking your approval because one segment of the phase three trail requires a variance, and that's a stone stairway, uh, but also due to your interest in the trail system in general from your discussions last January. So what's proposed with the phase three trails are these got to find the mouse again, are these green lines up here 
and down here, and those are accessible trails. And then this orange line here, which is a non-accessible trail. The main idea is to add a loop trail up here in the summer day use area, to add a loop trail there, and to add a more direct and scenic connector trail from the tent camping area to the trails that lead up to the summer day use area. And to add trails with views and interpretation of the old oxbow wetland in here. So we'll look at these in more detail later in the presentation. So in this presentation, we'll cover all the topics you're used to hearing about. And I'll just point out, to be clear as we go, that there's the proposal is part project and part variance. So there's just one aspect that needs a variance and other aspects that need the permit and order approval. So to try to break down that jurisdiction, it's important to realize that the project site includes three land use areas, and I'll show a map illustrating them later on. They're rural use, moderate intensity use, and hamlet. Establishment of the campground by the DEC requires review by the APA pursuant to Section 814 of the Adirondack Park Agency Act. And this Section 814 order is needed for the entire project in all of those land use areas. The portion of the project on the rural use lands is also a rivers project, requiring an agency permit pursuant to Part 577 of agency regulations, because it involves the establishment of a campground within the Scroon River Recreational River Area. So this 814 jurisdiction and river area jurisdiction still exist for these phase three trail improvements. And then in addition, the prior permit and order can, can contain conditions that require a new or amended permit or prior written approval from the agency. So for instance, condition six applies to new land use and development. Condition seven applies to trail construction. Condition nine applies to vegetative clearing related to trail construction. And condition 15 applies to any bridges in proximity to the Scroon River. So for all of these reasons, we're reviewing these phase three trail improvements. These are the conclusions of law stated in the draft permit and order that the agency needs to reach in order to approve the project including finding that the development is consistent with the land use and development plan, complies with the shoreline restrictions, that there will be no undue adverse impact on resources of the river area or the park, is consistent with the purposes and policies of the Wild Scenic and Recreational River System Act, and complies with the restrictions and standards of that act. And then the one aspect of the proposal that requires a variance, the stone stairway, uh, has its own jurisdiction coming from section 577 of agency regulations which establishes a minimum shoreline setback of 150 feet from the mean high water mark of the Scroon River for all structures of any size uh, although there are exceptions so I've underlined bridges are not included and that's why the timber footbridge here does not need a variance but the stone stairway does. And then part 576 of agency regulations <coughs> lists the factors to be considered before granting the variance. So you should have received with your packet for this meeting the variance record, and that included the 16 exhibits and the audio recording of our variance hearing. And one purpose of this presentation is to assist you in reviewing that record, considering the variance factors, and making a decision to approve or deny the variance. And as you know, staff recommends approval of the variance based on the record. Okay, so where are we? You're probably all familiar with this project by now and know where we are, but just for review, we're at the tip of the arrow here in the town of North Hudson, Essex County. For a regional context, we've got the project site, or at least the involved tax parcels outlined in black here, 
Here is the Adirondack Northway, this heavy yellow line. Exit 29 is right here. Here's State Route 9, running north-south, north to Elizabethtown, south to Scroon Lake, and then the Blue Ridge Road running west to Newcomb. The town line between, oh, it's hard to point straight here. The town line between North Hudson and Scroon is right here, with North Hudson on the north and Scroon to the south. Zooming in, we can see the three land use areas I was talking about more clearly. So we have rural use in yellow, moderate intensity use in red, hamlet in brown. This is Frontier Town Road and Route 9. The hamlet portion of the project site is currently owned by Essex County. The moderate intensity use and rural use portions are owned by the town of North Hudson. And the project contains 3,900 feet of shoreline on the Scroon River. So as I mentioned, the rural use portion of the project is within the Scroon River Recreational River area. The project site is this 91 acre portion of these tax parcels. DEC and the landowners have indicated that the 91 acre project site and possibly surrounding land as well will be encumbered by a future conservation easement. And then I'll also just point out the nearby state land with the Hoffman Notch Wilderness to the west and the Hammond Pond Wild Forest to the east. As you can see from this air photo of the project site, it was uh, before it became a campground, it was primarily wooded with a clearing in the northern portion where there's now a summer day use area. You can see a sand and gravel extraction owned by the town of North Hudson across Route 9 to the east. And you can see areas of prior development from the Frontier Town theme park. And this area is where the Paradox Brewery is now under construction. For existing conditions, the applicant provided this image on the right, which is an ortho mosaic, stitching together a lot of different photos, uh, taken by a drone in October of 2018 that shows the work completed in 2018. Mm -hmm. Viewing it next to the previous air photo, you can see the before and after. And in the next slides, I'll show some photographs provided by the applicant of the development that has been completed. This is the entrance to the Frontier Town Campground. Here you can see the entrance sign and the ticket booth and the state seal. This is the equestrian camping area in use with some horses in the tie stalls and some trailers in the campsites. Here's the equestrian camping area again with a pavilion and a ramp for mounting and dismounting a horse. Here's a drone image of the summer day use area where you can see the playground and pavilion. And the Scroon River is just behind the trees at the top of the photo back there. Are those solar panels? <clears throat> Uh, I picnic think tables, they're they benches. Yeah. These are in the foreground. These are picnic <laughs> tables <laughs> and grills and maybe benches. <laughs> this is the recycling building and the shower building. <clears throat> and the campground roads. This is the view from the caretaker's cabin, showing part of the cabin and the staff cabin. And these are phase one and two trails that have already been constructed. 
an example of an accessible trail. It has an eight foot wide surface <clears throat> and up to a maximum of 12 foot wide clearing. And then the non accessible trail uh, because it was a steeper grade and has stairs. And I should mention when we talk about accessible, also accessible to horses, people that have horses at the campground. So moving into the proposed project, I'm, I'm splitting it up uh, into the two land use areas to try to sort out what's happening where. So we'll start with the Hamlet land use area and the trails that are proposed in the summer day use area. So it's right up here next to the river. So again, with the overall trail plan, this is the section we're looking at right now. And where were we? Right there? Yep, we're up, up in this northerly oval in the summer day use area, these green phase three accessible trails. This is the proposal. So looking at that close up, what's proposed is a new loop trail that would be accessible it would connect from the parking lot around to the river and back. There would be also a connection to the pavilion and playground area. And these two spurs over to the river that we're calling viewpoints. Don't get confused by these red squiggly lines. These are not limits of clearing. This is just to draw a circle around what's newly proposed. I've traced those lines onto that 2018 photo from October. This is, these are approximate locations of the trails, but you can see the parking lot and the bathroom and pavilion and playground and how the trail would loop around and go in and out of the trees along the river and these two viewpoints the northerly viewpoint would be more in the trees and the southerly viewpoint for the rivers in an existing clearing. <coughs> the trails are about, when they're near the river, they're about 10 to 80 feet from the river itself. The trail would wind through the trees and require removal of eight trees in excess of six inches in diameter at breast height. The two river viewpoints are at their closest point five feet from the mean high water mark of the river. This detail drawing shows the trail widths. So again, the surface itself is eight feet wide and then the clearing to include the trail is up to a maximum of 12 feet. For stormwater purposes, the trail grade is built to slope away from the river from one half to percent to two percent. Ariel, uh, yep. I may have missed it, but how long is that little section of trail? It's hard to get a sense of the scale. I didn't say it, and that's a good question. Um, I just saw that information in the, I wanna say like 1600 feet. Yes, 1,600 foot network of accessible trails around the summer day use area. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of what the viewpoint would look like, but I'll emphasize example. This is not the project site, this is not the Scroon River, yeah. just an example of what it would look like. So the intent is to have a low stone wall you could also think of it as a curb, something to mark what the end of the trail is and provide a curb stop for wheelchairs and strollers. This is the detailed drawing of that accessible viewing area, 30 feet long by 10 feet deep, 16 inches maximum of exposed stone if you were viewing it from the river. 
and again the finished grade slopes away from the river. The stone would be a natural granite and the face view area seen from the river would be less than 100 square feet. So again there are two of those viewpoints. The southerly one is in this clearing. It would be in this clearing down here. And here's a view of that southerly viewpoint from the river. This is the same clearing. And then this is a photo of the northerly viewpoint seen from the perspective of the trail. You can see how there are more trees in this location. Ariel, if you were on the river, you, you wouldn't be pulling up with a kayak or anything to try to get out there and climb up, right? Not at that slope, I don't think. <coughs> but I guess that's up to the kayaker. <laughs> that's not their intention. So those are the improvements proposed in the summer day use area. We'll shift gears now um, to the rural use area. Okay, so we'll be in, in the river area itself now. So we'll be at this southerly oval. Got to find my mouse again. Here we go. Um, so again, this orange segment of trail and green segment here and down here. So again, the intent is to connect the tent camping area with a more direct and scenic route up to existing trails that would bring you to the summer day use area rather than walking around and through the campground or on the campground roads. The orange segment would not be accessible but the green segments would be accessible. Again the red squiggly lines are not the limits of clearing just marking what's newly proposed. This, the trail leading to the wetland here, actually all of the screen trail, uh, follows an existing trail that's already there and would just be improved to have that accessible surface. And the two viewpoints on either side of the wetland would have the same low stone wall curb structure that the river viewpoints have. So again, I've attempted to draw those lines on the October 2018 drone photo so you can see how they fit in with the vegetation and the campground. And these are the wetlands that formed in the old river oxbow. At one point, the applicant was interested in building a boardwalk to cross the wetland, but that eventually withdrew that aspect of the proposal. It's a value two wetland and crossing the wetland with a boardwalk or other structure could result in adverse impacts due to wetland loss beneath the structure, stormwater runoff and pollution from horse waste. So the two wetland viewpoints proposed on either side of the wetland will still allow the campground and day use visitors to view the wetland and learn about it through some interpretive signage. And this is the view a trail user would have of the Oxbow wetland from one of the wetland viewpoints if they're there in November, which probably won't be the prime season. <laughs> so zooming in further to the trail along the river, obviously the river is up here shaded in blue. This blue line is the mean high water mark of the river. This purple line is the 150 foot structure setback for the river area. This dashed black line is the existing trail. Remember it was part of the town's um, trail network for biking and horseback riding and hiking. And then the solid black line is the proposed trail. So you see for most of its length it follows the existing trail. 
And then here, where the trail needs to navigate this steep slope and this intermittent stream, that's where some changes to the route are proposed, moving it back away from the river and having a stone stairway here and a footbridge here. So for right now, we'll focus on the footbridge. It's located where that red oval is drawn and proposed across an intermittent stream. The footbridge would be 20 feet from the mean high water mark of the river, 50 feet from the edge of the water. And remember, it does not require a variance because it's exempt as a structure in the river regulations. Here are the plan view and elevation drawings of the footbridge and various dimensions. From the outer posts, it's four feet, 10 inches wide. There are stone steps on either side and the, those steps are five feet wide. The span of the bridge is 25 feet across the stream, but from the edge, outer edges of the steps, the full length is 30.3 feet. The height of the railings is uh, three and a half feet. And then from the very bottom structural component of the bridge over the mean high water mark of the stream, um, there's a, a space of 18 inches there to be sure that the bridge won't impede the stream's water flowing between the river and the wetland. The applicant minimized the dimensions of the footbridge to the extent practicable to reduce its size and the resulting area of the footbridge is 147.5 square feet. And this is where it would be located. You can almost, it's hard to see the terrain with the snow, but you can see maybe a dip in here. And that's the path of the intermittent stream. So if the bridge would cross that, kind of where that fallen log is. So then the variance is needed for the stone stairway. So that same map, again, this is the mean high water mark. This is the 150 foot setback. You can see how close these topographic lines are here. This is a 58% slope. So it's the stairway is proposed right here. The existing trail that goes down that slope, this dash line, when it gets to the bottom of the slope, it's 17 feet from the mean high water mark. The stairway has been moved back here so that at the bottom of the slope, it's 47 feet from the mean high water mark. That change in angle towards the river will also help to make it less visible from the river, something that approaches the river diagonally like this would be more visible from people paddling this way. Something parallel to the river like this won't be as visible. Oh, and while we're on this map too, I wanted to point out this symbol. Um, boy, it barely looks brown, but it is. This line with the squares, that's the symbol for the erosion control that they have proposed that would be either silt fence or compost filter socks. I, did I see a question? So, Aaron, so the black and yellow exist, that's the existing trail now, correct? Right. It, is that going to be now blocked off so that'll no longer be available, or will that continue to be available? I expect it will be in some way. Uh, we didn't discuss that directly, but certainly the intent is to keep people from, you know, roughing it down the steep sandy slope and using the preferred route of the stone stairway. And Area, but probably <laughs> given an option, somebody would take the easier route over the scramble. Mm -hmm. The clearance of the bridge of 18 inches doesn't sound very much. Is that stream not flood regularly? I mean, is that not an issue? It's 18 from mean high water. So that's, the stream is normally lower than that. Okay. But it's above mean high. Okay. Is it yeah. Nice? I want to say probably because there's ice here on the Oxbow wetland. I'm 
when you, the stream connects. <laughs> if we, That's if why I'm sensitive to the question. <laughs> if we back out a little bit, you can see how it connects. This gray shape is the intermittent stream, and then this light blue shape, that's the Oxbow wetland. So it's serving a, a, the function of connecting water from the river itself into the wetland. And I'm sure at different times of the season it flows different directions in and out. But that 18 inches is a standard when we build something over a wetland or over a stream to have that above mean high water. Okay, and it's not the full river anyway. It's a, sort of a little... Yeah. Yeah, an Small intermittent, streams, so it's yeah, not even wet year round. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, now I gotta catch up. Where were we? Okay, so stone stairway. So uh, here's the drawing. The stairway would come down to the landing, and then over, um, and the trail would then cross the, the footbridge, and connect up with the rest of the trails. Obviously, it can't be an accessible trail with that terrain. So we'll zoom in to look at the dimensions. There's a 17-foot elevation change from the top of the, from where you are in the tent camping area down to the landing by the river. So that makes a 58% slope. There would be 23 steps. Each step is four feet wide by two and a half feet deep. The steps, of course, overlap, so one foot, four inches is exposed that you're stepping on. The length of the stairway is 32 feet, and the stairway area is 128 feet. There's no railing proposed. And um, obviously from the prior map, the entire structure is within the setback. And it's 47 feet from the mean high water mark. This is a photo of the existing trail location where you would scramble down the steep sandy slope. Again, this points kind of diagonally towards the river. And then back in the woods here is where they would move to build, um, build the stairway more parallel to the river. So this drone keeps coming in handy. No one had to go swimming in November. But we have this photo provided by the applicant of how the stairway would appear viewed from the river. Um, so this is that existing trail pointed diagonally at the river, a stone stairway more parallel with the river and pretty low with existing grade and no railing um, wouldn't be very noticeable from the river. And then the bridge crosses right where that, near where that log was. This is the character of the shoreline in this area, below the tent camping area. This is looking south. And this is looking north. Following receipt of the variance and permit applications for this permit and order, the agency notified all parties as required by our regulations. There were public notices published or sent to adjoining landowners, published in the Environmental Notice Bulletin, posted on our own website, and the hearing notice was also published in the newspaper. No new comment letters were received. As you may recall, there was one letter received during review of the prior project that was offered conceptual support for the project, provided it avoids negative on and off-site impacts. We held our variance hearing on January 23rd in the town of North Hudson, and the hearing was attended by agency staff, the applicant and its consultant, and five members of the public. Two individuals provided comment in support of the project during the hearing, and uh, no comment letters were received. No Excuse me? No comment. No comment. No comment. So, considering the record, I'll present staff's analysis of the variance factors. Factor one, 
whether the application requests the minimum relief necessary. The applicant reduced the stairway width to what they felt was the minimum practicable to four feet to allow trail users to safely pass. The 32 feet in length is necessary to travel safely down and up that steep slope. And the resulting area is 128 square feet. Again, there's no vertical element, such as a handrail. The existing trail that descends the slope is 17 feet from the river. This proposed stairway would, at its closest point, be 47 feet from the mean high water mark of the river. Factor two, whether granting the variance will create a substantial detriment to adjoining or nearby landowners. Both sides of the river are owned by the town of North Hudson in this location. The stairway is greater than 800 feet from the property boundary to the north, which is actually part of the campground and owned by Essex County, and greater than, 100, or greater than 1,800 feet from the property boundary to the south, owned by the state of New York and designated wild forest. Factor three, whether the difficulty can be resolved by a feasible method other than a variance. The applicant considered whether they could build something descending the slope outside the setback, but that would involve needing to cross that value to wetland at the base of the slope. They evaluated whether they could descend the slope or have a trail on it without a structure at all, um, but it just didn't seem safe to walk down such a steep slope with sandy, erodible soils. And that's basically what they have now, and that is resulting in some um, erosion and possibly sedimentation into the waters below. And agency staff suggested um, that the applicant look at something other than stone stairs that wouldn't require a variance, such as a log or timber stairway. But um, after looking at that option, it seemed that it would result in greater soil disturbance because they would need to have um, interconnected side logs required for each step, so more disturbance on each side. And then in order to have the soil tread beneath the steps, the whole staircase would end up being longer. And then because timbers would need to be replaced more frequently than stone, there would just be greater disturbance over time and over the area. So it didn't seem like a, a, a wiser alternative. So factor four, the manner in which the difficulty arose, a lot of it just stems from the existing terrain where the tent camping area is higher on the plateau. There's a big drop down to the landing by the river, a steep slope, sandy soils. And then the fact that there's an existing trail system there that already has trails in this area, including um, one going down the slope. Factor five, whether granting the variance will adversely affect existing resources. From the perspective of water quality, a stone stairway will actually prevent further erosion and sedimentation and be an improvement to what is there now. And there are no anticipated impacts to water quality. From the perspective of shoreline character and aesthetics, with the stairway constructed at grade, surrounded by natural vegetation, and not facing the river directly, staff believe it will not be readily apparent from the river. Factor six, whether the imposition of conditions upon the granting of the variance will minimize potential adverse effects. The, there are conditions in the draft permit and order about adhering to the project plans, including implementing the proposed erosion control and staying within the limits of clearing. And so both with the project design and these conditions, um, staff believe that adverse effects would be prevented. So staff do recommend approval of both the project and the granting of the variance with conditions. Agency regulations include a balancing test that a variance will be granted when the adverse consequences to the applicant resulting from denial are greater than the public purpose sought to be served by the restriction. And of course, the public purpose of the restriction is the protection of water quality and shoreline aesthetics and character of the Scroon River. Staff's analysis is that the request is the minimum relief. There are no impacts to neighbors. There are, are no better alternatives. The difficulty stems from their natural terrain and the existing trail system. 
the stairway will actually prevent water quality impacts and that will not be readily apparent from the river. And so for this balancing test, staff concluded that the adverse consequences to the applicants resulting from denial are greater than the public purpose sought to be served by the restriction and therefore we recommend the agency consider approving the requested variance. And recall that there are other parts of the project that aren't just the variance. Staff also believe that the necessary conclusions of law can be reached for the entire proposal for the phase three trail improvements. The permit conditions that were in the um, prior permit and order have been carried forward in this new one that supersedes the old one. Felt that was better to just keep the whole package together than end up with many individual permits. And so those include following the project plans, the wastewater plan, the stormwater plan, and getting agency authorization prior to changes to those plans. Um, prior agency review for some things and other aspects like lighting and um, retaining vegetation and planting the landscaping plan, invasive species, etc. So with that, I conclude and happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the committee? Uh, Ariel, I, I apologize. I keep having uh, flashbacks from personal life, but <laughs> I built a, a very similar stone staircase without a rail and was overruled by family and others and forced to put in a rail. I realized there was a consideration for visibility, but it, I, is everybody comfortable that this young people, old people don't need a rail on this fairly steep stair? stair Case. Uh, none was proposed from the very beginning. Okay. Um, was so, even a consideration. Sorry, okay, was well, I didn't hear that. Environmentally, it's oh. probably better without it. But uh, right, you know. it certainly be less visible without it. Yep. Um, and none was proposed from the beginning, so I I can't I can't really answer what went into that decision. Okay. But that was the decision. Thank you. Did we discuss? Um, what kind of stone? The shreds are made out of. It was granite. Is it granite? A granite, I believe. Do you know, is it like a bluish green, or do we not know that either? I don't know that detail. If that's important to you, I could certainly find well, out. Well, I just obviously we're trying to blend it into the surroundings, so right. there's certainly plenty of granite around that can blend than not. I would ask the same question, or if, sorry to interrupt, Chad, um, of the uh, crushed stone that will be going down to that one landing spot that's pretty open. Mm -hmm. um, that, that would be very visible if it was that kind of brighter gray crushed stone. So if yeah. there's any consideration that could be made to kind of blend that in, yeah. I think it would make for a better trail from a uh, river view. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll ask that and there's back the, to you. There's certainly those alter options in the park. There's different kinds of crusher run and different kinds of treads that could meet that. What, and the crusher run you're referring to, I mean, these are solid the, steps. No, no, no but there's landings space. near the river. What are you going to use crush stone? At the bottom? Yeah. Okay. We'll ask those questions. You have limestone quarries and you have other quarries that are using native stone to crush it. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Question. Is this two motions or is the variance all part of the same motion? Oh, We've prepared one. the document as one, one. authorization. Okay. That's why it has Thank the you. two numbers. A quick question. The bridge materials? of the bridge, it, all natural materials? Um, it has steel abutments, but the rest is, the bridge itself is timber, and then there are the stone steps, two steps on either side. Do we know what uh, <coughs> kind of timber it is to see how long it's gonna last? I can ask that too. If I just make one comment then, uh, when we originally did this um, permit here that to put the campground in, 
the trail system hadn't been completed, and I think that's what brings us back here today. And there was a kind of an, un, an uncertainty um, about building a campground on the shores of this beautiful river, almost an invitation for people to run down those steep slopes. And I think this trail is thoughtful, and it uh, will probably satisfy the public interest in getting to the river's edge and viewing mm -hmm. it. I think it's it's, it's yeah, a great the enhancement. Place, the, the stone steps are important to to eliminate the erosion problems and so I personally think uh, DEC's done a good job in planning on this and um, I'm in favor of it and uh, if there's no other questions we'll ask for a vote of the committee to move to the full board for a vote. I'm glad to move it. Moved by Art, second. Second by John. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you. I'll get you those answers on materials. Can I make a comment? I'd, I'd like to, I should have done this at the beginning of the meeting, but I think it's proper for me to recuse myself from the vote tomorrow on this, on this matter as the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <It's not funny>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right, is there any old business? It's true. New business? Hearing none, Madam Chair, we're all, we're all done with regulatory programs. Great. Our speakers are here, but um, why don't we, t <clears throat> excuse me, I'm get, just getting over a cough, and uh, I apologize for all my noise. Um, Let's just take a 15-minute break. We'll reconvene at uh, 2.45 with Park Ecology Committee. Thank you. Sweet. Yeah. Pretty big.
Okay, back from our break. And we're going to start with Park Ecology. John? Thank you. I thought that was a vacation, not a break. I mean, mm. um, I guess our uh, first order of business is to consider and uh, approve, if you will, the draft minutes from December 13th meeting. Um, can I have a motion to? Glad, sir. Thank you, Art. I'll is, there, it. is there any discussion? Brad, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, Kathy, would Thank you, you please do the RAS report? And I carry will. On. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, I bet you guys didn't think you'd be seeing me as much after I changed roles, but I'm back. Um, Robin asked me to make a mention for planning that the uh, local government day is coming up on April 3rd and 4th, and that the registration is due March 20th. Okay, so unless you want to pay the late fee, it's due March 20th. And the agenda is now up on our website, and there's some information over here for the public on the table. Okay. Um, I'd like to provide you with some updates on the RAS division. So over the past two months, staff have been patiently trying to train me in my new role. Um, compiling the annual report proved to be a really good task for getting me oriented. So um, you will be seeing that next month. I've met with everyone individually, I've met with people in various groups, and I'm starting to see what works well, which is almost everything. Um, these guys are just remarkable to work for. They're just remarkable people, and you know that. Um, one change that I am looking to make is in your report, the, minute, uh, the monthly report. The format um, bothered me a little bit in that when the, t the charts were really useful because they show numbers. They were good for counting things like number of deep hole test pits and things like that that were countable. But when it got to the point where we were looking at um, meetings we attend and groups that we participate with, it was hard to understand what our role was in those. So I'm going to be putting those into a slightly different format for you. And I'll be dividing that section into subheadings of uh, committees and working groups, outreach and education, conferences and trainings. And I think it'll make it easier to see if for you and for the public to understand what it is that we're doing outside of our tasks, our day-to-day -day tasks. And although you uh, are going to be getting a updated report for January and February next month, I'm going to go over a few highlights this month because I'm not sure if I will be speaking next month. Um, Sean and Alicia, our engineers, have been attending, uh, trained, attended a training on stormwater pollution prevention plan, or SWIP, preparation and review. Preparing, reviewing, and implementing a SWIP is essential to construction stormwater planning and in addressing water quality and water quantity impacts. Required elements of partial and full SWIPs were discussed, including site planning, erosion, and sediment control, hydrology, housekeeping and post-production, construction management, and maintenance. Staff received seven professional development hours for completing this training, and these professional development hours are required for these licensed engineers. Aaron, uh, our forester and soil scientist, attended the New York State Society of American Foresters meeting, annual meeting in Syracuse. The theme for that meeting was timberland investment in the northeast, or northern forest, activities and impl implications. Sessions attended included the State of New York, New York Forestry, Timberland Investment in the Northern Forest, Conservation Easements and Timberland Investments, Wildlife Issues in New York Forest Management, and Moving Forward with 480A. Lee attended a, a Lake Champlain Technical Advisory Committee earlier this month. He attends these every other month. The committee is comprised of natural science professionals from academia, management agencies, and others with a wide variety of experience who all work within the Lake Champlain Basin. The meeting consisted primarily on reviewing and commenting on research done on nutrition, nutrient runoff from agricultural tile fields. 
The committee also heard updates on Lake Champlain Barrier Project and nutrient loading reduction proposals for the developed lands in Vermont. Mary has been representing RAS at interagency meetings with DOT, DEC, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to discuss connectivity issues surrounding uh, culvert replacement projects. She's also been working with DOT to create a list of native plant species appropriate for restoring roadsides following construction activities. And at the end of January, we learned another staff change. Mark Brooks is retiring. We knew it was coming up. It ended up coming up a little faster than we anticipated. So after 20 years of service with the agency and some more service with New York State, Mark will be re, uh, retiring in two weeks. Um, Mark's position has been posted, and we're accepting applications until February 22nd. We will miss him greatly. He's been a great employee. So moving on to today's business. This afternoon we have the honor and pleasure of having three talented Paul Smith professors from the Natural Science Department. Drs. Kurt Steger, Celia Evans, and Leanne Spohr. They will be presenting on climate change in the Adirondacks, predictions, evidence, and monitoring for changes that can impact local communities and ecosystems. I'd like to say a little bit about each of them. I didn't know which order they were speaking in, so it's not the correct order. Um, Dr. Steger is a climate scientist, educator, and author whose research deals with ecological histories of lakes in Africa and the Adirondacks. He's published in prominent journals, including Science and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, as well as periodicals such as National Geographic and the New York Times. And he co-hosts what most of us listen to regularly is Natural Selections, a weekly science program on North Country Public Radio. Dr. Steger is the author of four books, his most recent called Still Waters, The Secret World of Lakes. He holds the Draper Lucy, Lucy Endowment, Endowed Chair in Climate and Lake Ecology at Paul Smith College and is a research associate with the University of Maine's Climate Change Institute. Dr. Evans, who will be our first speaker, is an ecologist and educator fascinated by plant and plant-animal interactions in forests and wetlands. She has a PhD from Dartmouth College and a master in botany from the University of Toronto. She's also the International Programs Coordinator and the Fulbright Program Advisor at Paul Smith College. Dr. Evans loves to teach and collects long-term ecological data with her students. She's published in the Ecological Science, Science Education, and International Education Disciplines. Her recent work on climate change in the Northeast focuses on the loss of cold, snowy conditions and the impacts on biological and human communities. And Dr. Sporn has earned a PhD in toxicology from the University of Rochester School of Medicine, where she is also an associate professor of medicine. She's currently a professor of biology and coordinator of the new Human Health and the Environment program at Paul Smith College. Dr. Sporn has collaborated with New York State Department of Health for the last five years to monitor the emergence of tick-borne diseases in the North Country. And this is an area where she's extensively published, including on something I didn't know how to pronounce. So, <laughs> so I left it at that. So we will start, and uh, Dr. Evans will start, and then we will be followed by Dr. Sporn, and, follow, and finally with Dr. Steger. Thank you so much, Kathy, and everybody for inviting us here today to talk about something that I think is near and dear to all of our hearts. Here's the forward button. Did it work? No. I'd like to make it work. I'd like to make it work. Me? Yeah. Not working. Oh. Oh. There we go. Near and dear to all of our, let me just step back, our hearts. I think I would be remiss if I didn't say happy Valentine's Day. And we are all here because we love this place and the communities in it. So happy Valentine's Day. All right, so um, I'm going to start off, and I'm going to uh, give you this quick preview. So I'll, uh, my job today is going to be to talk about the big picture and, and try to present information, sort of broad ecological information that is, um, gives us a reason to really understand why it is we should be seeing climate change, unfortunately, here early on in the Adirondacks and, and why that is something we are, in fact, seeing. And then 
I do want to take an opportunity to talk about how do we find out whether climate is changing. And the way we best do that is to long-term monitor our communities and our ecosystems. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about some of that work that's going on at Paul Smith College for that. Then I'm going to step aside and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Leanne Sporn come up and talk about some really, really important work she's been doing with her students and with the Department of Health on natural communities and tick-borne diseases in human communities. And then we'll finish off with Dr. Steger talking um, about all, all the great work that he has been doing over the years um, and sharing some evidence of climate change in the Adirondacks. So when you look at the really big picture, at a global scale, simply looking at the mean annual temperature and the mean annual precipitation maps the biomes that we're familiar with. So um, at, the, at the global spatial scale, all you really have to know is what the mean annual temperature and precipitation are to, to predict what plant communities will be in a place. So that all, what that does is it gives you a sense of how important um, those two variables are. And those are the things that we're looking at changing. We're looking at temperature changes, we're looking at precipitation changes, and we're looking at the timing of those changes, those things changing, and we're looking at the variability in all of that changing. So these are really important components. But what I'd like you to look at is that red star there, and that's approximately where the Adirondacks would sit in this section of biomes. And what you can see is, of course, you know this, we're, we're actually have portions of the boreal forest in the Adirondack Park, but we are on the edge of the boreal biome. So places that are placed on the globe similar to this on the edges of these biomes are likely to be the ones that will see the changes in temperature and moisture sooner. And the Adirondacks is absolutely one of those places. Um, the other, so I'm going to, just going to give you a couple examples, some of the work that I've been doing with students in, in bog ecosystems. So when uh, organisms are at the, at the southern or the northern range of their limits, they're already outside of their, they're at the edges of their ecological zones of tolerance, right? And so organisms that, say, are at the southern end of their distribution, for example, Larix, Larissa, and our tamaracks, and the spruce, our, our black spruce, are very much, if you look at where the stars are, you can see in the distributions that the Adirondacks, these species that are in the Adirondacks, are very much at the lower end of their distribution. They are already stressed ecologically without the changes in climate, right? And so these are the kinds of things we might expect to see start to change. These are also wetland, and we have a lot of wetlands in the Adirondacks, and wetland ecosystems are adapted to moisture, various levels of it. Um, and so when you talk about changing moisture and temperature, wetland ecosystems ought to be some of the first communities that we really see changing with respect to climate. This is, now I want you to be really, I want to be really clear, this is a hypothesis. When you have one study done in one place, you don't have the answer to a question. And a lot of, so this isn't really representing long-term monitoring. My students and I saw this in um, the Heron Marsh we were looking at the abundance of spruce stems, um, spruce seedlings, it turns out. And we saw that in this marsh where the water temperatures were higher, we had a lower abundance. That doesn't mean that water temperature is causing the lower abundance, but it is a suggestion that we should look further. So these kinds of patterns we can see with monitoring, and then we can look further to see what the mechanisms are. So this is just a little bit of work that I've done with my students. And so we might be wondering what's going to happen with spruce. Spruce, in fact, other species of spruce are changing and decreasing in their distributions in places like Alaska. And they have attributed that to climate change. So it's a possibility. It's not an answer yet. But those are the kinds of things we're talking about. The other thing I want to say broadly and ecologically about why we should expect change in the Adirondacks is seasonality really matters. So when places like the Adirondacks where communities, human and natural communities, are have adapted, <laughs> and in, this, in, in the natural community sense, have evolved over time to be prepared to deal with these shifts in season. These are really extreme things that organisms have to go through. We sort of know that as humans. But these organisms that live in our communities, our wetlands and our forests, they got to deal with this every year. They have four seasons. And so they're very extreme changes. It takes a lot of biological energy to invest in developing proteins that help um, and, and chemicals that help to s not let your body freeze, um, adding changes in your coat, um, changes in your behavior, morphological changes, all kinds of things. So organisms that are adapted to these seasonal environments um, are the ones that when we start to 
see less difference between summer and winter temperatures, when we start to notice that our winters are warming faster than our summers, that we have shorter uh, winter seasons and fewer frost, excuse me, more frost-free days, right? That is really going to influence these communities where organisms have had to adapt to this, this seasonal shift. So the Adirondacks is absolutely one of those communities. Um, so again, we're expecting these things. Um, we can talk a little bit, I can't talk too much about the, the human community, but we know that these changes, seasonality really matters to our tourist economy and matters to our economies here. So when we see less distinct seasons and greater environmental variability, particularly in our shoulder seasons, as we might see at first, the oncoming of winter and the leaving of winter towards spring, Organisms develop cold tolerance through the winter. So this is going back to those communities that have developed and spent a lot of their energy in developing the ability to maintain their lives through the cold winter. And the other thing we're probably going to start to see is this decoupling of close ecological relationships. Um, when, um, when organisms are preparing for the shift in the seasons, they have a bunch of environmental cues that they respond to that allow them and their physio physi physiologies to start to change. One of them is almost always temperature. And another one is almost always day length. And it's a really interesting, and I hate to say interesting when I'm talking about climate change because it's very disturbing, but sort of intellectually interesting to think about these organisms, both plants and, and animals, um, what they're responding to usually used to over a reasonable amount of ecological time used to change together and that is temperature as the days became shorter temperatures became colder and those two things were fairly coupled you know for a, for a reasonable amount of ecological time what's happening now is day length isn't changing right the earth is still spinning around the sun it's still spinning around its axis so days are getting shorter the same as they were before and getting longer at the same times as they were before. But what is another thing that was tightly coupled with that is the temperature cue. And that temperature cue now is starting to go all over the place. And so there's, so in, in these seasonal places like where we live, that I think is going to be a huge uh, physiological challenge that will result in changes in our communities at that level. I think that's a really big question that scientists need to look at. Um, so. Those are some of the things um, that can happen in our communities, and I could talk really specifically about them, but, I, but I'm not going to because what I really want to do with the rest of my time is introduce some of the work that some of our other colleagues have been doing. I really want to convince you that long-term monitoring is the way to keep track of what's going on in these systems. I don't know that I need to convince you per se, but it sort of fell out of, a, fell out of favor in the last you know, 20 years. And, it is super important if we want to see how these systems are changing. We've got to be monitoring them. And the, the nice thing is at Paul Smith College, we walk out of our doors with our students and we monitor them. And so we're doing this monitoring. I'd like to share a little of McKaylee's work. Um, lucky us, we have McKaylee Glennon now. So thank, thank you, WCS. She's at the Watershed Institute. And she, you may have seen some of this work. She's been monitoring these bird communities for since 2004. And you can see that they have different, you know, some of them are more sensitive to competition, some to habitat type, some very much to climate stability. Um, and she's continuing this work, I know, with some of our students. So what she's, basically the bottom line is all but one of these species is declining. Um, and the northern species are the ones that are declining. And that is, those are the individuals that are on the southern end of their limits, right? Just like the tamarack potentially, just like the spruce potentially. So she's seeing that pattern that we would expect. Um, she's also been able to sort of rule out human disturbance because human disturbance, these are the places that she's studying are pretty protected sites from that standpoint. And so what she's seeing is that it's likely climate change as the culprit. Um, and also, she, she, her data is suggesting that it's less the temperature, but it's these crazy precipitation patterns that are likely affecting that. I want to talk about the work of Craig Maluski. He's been working with students in a watershed maybe for 10 years, Smitty Creek Watershed. They've been looking at trout. Trout's a really important species for us up here. And they've been studying four different little reaches, watersheds, and they're finding different things in each of them. It's an incredibly complex proposition to figure out what climate is going to do to our Adirondack communities, to any community. So let's not ever forget that. We have a lot of hypotheses, but the actual uh, details are pretty specific. But what he's found is, is that in this one little watershed that's pretty stable, and again, these are not published data. Please don't 
please don't leave and, and say that these are the things that are happening in the world. But this is a long-term monitoring that allows us to see patterns. And what he's seen, at least in one of those watersheds that's fairly stable, is that mean February temperatures, as they, if they're higher, he sees more success for the brook trout, which would be sort of a, a positive influence in February of a change or a warming. But he doesn't know the mechanism of that. Lots of things happen when air temperature warms. Could be snow melt, could be lots of things. So that variable of temperature, it's not clear what's really causing a change or if there is a cause. But it's really interesting and we wouldn't see that unless we were monitoring long term. So that's his take home message is that this little stable tributary um, may in fact be providing nicer, better incubation conditions in February for these little tiny brook trout. And he's continuing that work and so he'll have lots of data on that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Janet Myhook's work on Project Silk Moth. This is a, I don't know if you know about this, this is a very cool project and she, this was initiated when she read information that we actually were seeing a decline in silk moths in, in the Adirondacks and in New York. And so she took on this project and she has a citizen science project where she does a lot of the work at Paul Smith with her students but she also has a website that citizens in New York can go out and blacklight and actually send and put in information into this. So she's collecting this very cool data set. Um, and so far, she's it's just amazing. It's 395 moth species, and some of these are beautiful, gigantic things, and some are little tiny things, and she's pulling their abdomens off to look at their genitalia to determine. I mean, it's, you have to be an entomologist to love this. It's, it's so cool. She's, my, she's next door in the office to me, and I love, I love talking to her. Her passion is incredible. But we're just learning so much, and some of these are um, rare. Some of these are specific to wetlands. So if we start to gather more in information from different taxa in these different ecosystems, wetlands, we can look at the birds like Michaeli's do and we can look at the plant communities and we can look at the um, invertebrate communities and we can really paint a nice picture um, with this information we're collecting. It's really important to collect long-term data. All right. With that, I hope I've convinced you that long-term data matter, and I'm going to introduce Dr. Leanne Spohr to talk about some very cool, important work she's been doing. Let me turn that on. Very good. All right. Um, so climate change is driving many changes in the Adirondacks. Uh, Kurt's going to do a big overview of that after I'm done. And some of these can influence human health. So vector-borne diseases are influenced by climate. Um, so far, the biggest uh, vector that we're concerned about here in the Adirondacks, I say so far, because mosquitoes may move in uh, soon, are the black-legged tick or the deer tick, shown on the slide. Uh, so for the past five years, um, as you know, I've been involved in a collaborative project with the New York State Department of Health, uh, Communicable Bureau of Communicable Disease Control, and we've been able to document and track the emergence of these ticks and the, and the diseases they carry here in the North Country. Whoops. There we go. So um, when considering tick-borne diseases, such as Lyme, and I'm going to focus a lot on Lyme because it's the uh, most prevalent uh, tick-borne disease in the country and in this area, there are many factors that may influence its presence in the landscape or its ecology. Uh, we know of Lyme, which is caught Lyme, as something that might give you a bullseye rash, might make you feel like you have the flu, and maybe even have chronic manifestations. It's caused by the bacteria known as Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a spiral-shaped uh, spiral spirochete. Um, you think of it associated with the bite of a tick, but ticks are actually born free of Lyme disease. They acquire Lyme, the Lyme bacteria, upon feeding on small mammals. And so small mammals and some birds are the reservoirs for Lyme disease out there in the landscape. So you can think of it, the tick might actually, it's really not their fault. It's sort of the fault of the small mammals and the birds, but they're not as cute as the small mammals, so we blame it on them. Um, <laughs> it's kind of true. So in order to understand the ecology, we have to consider many things. Um, Birds are competent reservoirs. They can infect new ticks, and they fly. So I think birds, especially ground nesting and ground feeding birds, are probably um, big contributors to the spread of ticks in an area such as the Adirondacks. Uh, deer, the deer tick, actually, I've kind of ironically, deer aren't involved in maintaining Lyme disease in the landscape. They can become infected, but they cannot infect other ticks. Uh, they don't get sick from Lyme disease, so they're considered dead-end hosts. 
Um, then, of course, when humans or their domestic pets encounter Lyme disease from a tick bite, we are really the only ones in this whole picture who get sick. So animals encounter ticks when they, the ticks are exhibiting this behavior, which is known as questing. So under suitable weather conditions, and those are temperatures above 40 degrees, ample humidity, ticks are very susceptible to desiccation. So that's the, the biggest cause of them not surviving is drying out. Um, and low wind speed, high wind speeds can cause their desiccation. They tend to climb up onto foliage at just the right height to encounter the appropriate mammal host. So in the springtime, the little nymphs will be about six inches off the ground to encounter a small mammal, and in the fall, they'll be up to about waist high to encounter a deer. So the more days that they have these suitable conditions, the more likely the tick will be able to feed on an animal and complete its life cycle. So you can start to see the connection between weather and climate, and warmer and wetter means uh, more days that the tick can find a host, and feed and reproduce, and thus become established. So we have are seeing more and more established tick populations here in the North Country. Um, but ticks only spend about 5% of their time doing this behavior, even though that's where we encounter them. And about 95% of the time, they spend um, in the forest floor, sort of nestled down in the duff layer uh, or leaf litter. It's nice and humid there. They're protected from desiccation. They do go through and need to go through a period of dormancy in the winter. Um, but they're susceptible to extended cold. So yes, they can overwinter, and they do. They must as part of their life cycle. It's a two-year life cycle, uh, but extended cold can, can cause them to be lost. Um, so you can start to see how climate ch change could affect the success of ticks in the landscape, and we're definitely seeing that here. So many things can drive the spread of ticks, but I wouldn't be here if the answer wasn't that. What, so ask the question, what is driving the spread of ticks in the Adirondacks. Of course, we can't prove it, but every indicator points to climate change as the driving force. Um, in other areas where ticks are maybe well established, so as Celia mentioned, we are on the edge of, of many things, of biomes. We're also on the edge of suitable habitat for ticks, right on the edge. Most of you know that the southern part of the state has endemic um, tick-borne diseases. Uh, ticks are well established and have been for many decades, but we're an emergent area. Um, and in other areas where ticks are already well established, probably climate change isn't causing them to increase their numbers. Other factors such as host availability, changes in the mammal population might be affecting their numbers, but here on the edge in the emergent area, climate change does appear to be driving, driving it. And we are definitely in the path of this spread. So I'd like to present some data about changes in tick-borne disease incidents here in the North Country. I'm going to focus on Lyme. As I mentioned, um, it is the most prevalent uh, vector-borne disease in the country and certainly in this region. Um, but there are other tick-borne diseases of concern that are emergent, meaning their numbers are increases, and we are starting to see cases of those popping up here in the North Country. Uh, babesiosis, which is a malaria-like parasite, Anaplasmosis, we've seen a little bit of a, I won't call it an outbreak, but definitely uh, some numbers of cases in Essex County last year. And then there is the kind of scary Powassan encephalitis, which uh, I'll mention briefly at the, at the end of the talk. So this data is taken from the New York State Department of Health's uh, database, and it shows in this case, the human cases of Lyme from 2006 to the present, both statewide in blue and in uh, counties of the North Country. And so what I plotted here were Clinton, Essex, Franklin, and St. Lawrence counties. Those are our main targets of our, our efforts. Uh, so notice that the scales, the axis is different. Of course, statewide, we're going to have a lot more than in the North Country. And these are just simply number of cases. That's the need for the difference in scale. So whereas statewide, there hasn't been much increase in the incidence, in the number of cases of Lyme over the past decade, slight increase, but nothing dramatic, uh, that's not the case here in the North Country. We're seeing a dramatic rise in number of cases. Um, so Lyme disease is reported where it's diagnosed. So you could argue both ways here. This might be a gross underestimate of cases actually locally acquired in the Adirondacks. Many of our, res our seasonal 
uh, vis residents and visitors who might acquire Lyme disease here would probably be diagnosed when they go back home. So this could be an underreporting. It also, but it, you could argue that we are more aware of Lyme here and that it's being more frequently diagnosed in more recent years here in the Adirondacks. So we'd have to take this with a grain of salt. And that is why I focus my efforts on studying ticks out in the landscape. So we'll, I'll come to that. So looking at some data a little bit different way. In this graph, the numbers have been converted into incidents per 100,000. So it's been normalized sort of per capita. And the numbers are, here are broken down by county. So the red line, again, shows statewide incidence rates, the number per 100,000 people. It has remained fairly steady since 1998. Uh, incidences in Essex, which is yellow, and uh, St. Lawrence County, which is the dark blue, have risen sharply in recent years. And you can see that in Franklin and Clinton County, we're just on the verge of starting to see the increase. Uh, incidence rates in Essex County last year were six-fold higher than the statewide incidence. And I just have to think back, when I started, when I became involved in this in 2014, the common lore was there is no Lyme disease or ticks in the Adirondacks. And now we have a six-fold higher incidence than, the average, than statewide. Hmm. I remember when they said there were no ticks. No ticks. In the, uh, right? Okay, so right. So these emergent areas, it takes a while to shift our, our, our ideas about it. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon. I wanted to show you this too, and then I'll, I'll get away from the graphs for a minute. So there are some interesting trends. So I include here Dutchess County in green, and it's in the lower Hudson Valley, which is a Lyme endemic area. Uh, it's often touted as a county with the highest Lyme disease incidence in the state, and it still is very high. But since 2002, notice that the incidence has been sharply decreasing, perhaps due to risk awareness there, perhaps due to the fact that the biology of the disease might be changing. Uh, that's a need for more basic science study of this disease. Um, it can change and evolve out there in the landscape. But regardless, it seems clear that in emergent areas such as the Adirondacks, and this is the same data I showed you before, uh, people are at the at greatest risk. And unfortunately, areas such as ours are very, grossly underserved by public health agencies. And a lot of dollars and effort go to these more populated areas where the incidence is actually going down and the incidence here is going up. So I'm working as hard as I can to raise awareness uh, and doing some lobbying to ensure that we have continued support to watch this here in the North Country. So whereas we're underserved because we have a low year-round population, we can't forget, and I know none of you in this room would, that we do host millions of visitors per year, and I think we're a bit responsible uh, for uh, informing them of, of risks of tick-borne diseases. So a few years ago, a student uh, put together these maps. Um, same day showed a little different way, showing changes in Lyme incidence throughout the state from 1994 to 2016. And this demonstrates the northward, so the darker the red, uh, the higher the incidence. Um, the northward and to a, some extent westward expansion or spread of Lyme incidence. And notice that Essex County here has some of the highest incidence of Lyme in the state. And that was in 2016. The numbers have actually gone up since then. So this is an issue here. So our work has focused mainly on studies of host-seeking field-collected ticks, and that's for, done for a reason. Um, the experts at the Department of Health informed me that the most critical piece of information to protect human health in areas where ticks are present is this information. Where are the ticks in the landscape and what diseases do they harbor? And that's what m the majority of our work is focused on. So I have been involved in a five-year long study. Uh, work very closely with the Department of Health to ensure that all our uh, surveillance efforts are, um, are uh, consistent with those in other parts of the state and uh, the testing is done at the state so that our data can be part of both statewide and federal databases and that's really very important. We also ensure that any communication that we have about our results is overseen by the authorities at the state and I think it's, that, again, that's uh, I think a strength of our work. 
we are well connected with the appropriate agencies to do this. So twice a year we go out into the landscape throughout the North Country. We try to hit sites in, in as many counties as we can. Uh, we attempt to collect 50 ticks from each life stage or from two of the three life stages, the nymphs in the summertime, uh, early summer, and then the adults in the fall. And we submit these for pathogen testing. Um, this involves, it's very simple, it involves sweeping the forest floor with drag cloths. Um, it allows us to estimate tick density and to test for five human pathogens. So in 2017, a group of senior students working on their senior capstone project did a very extensive survey of the North Country. They went to about 40 sites um, and found, so here is sort of relative density of ticks that they found. Um, so the yellow is the lowest density, um, there's intermediate density and then high density in red. So this is just, just relative. So there is risk of tick encounter throughout the region. Maybe not at the summit of Mount Marcy, uh, but tick densities are highest still at lowest elevations. Um, a few high elevation sites in Tupper Lake, one at the Wild Center, uh, were recently found a couple of years ago and it seems as though the tick numbers are increasing at both of those sites. Um, these are elevations around 1,800 feet, and um, as far as I know, that's the highest elevation that we, probably in the state, that, that populations of ticks have become established. They tend to be a low elevation um, critter. So um, as climate change occurs, the ticks are not only moving northward into the Adirondacks, but they're also moving up into the higher elevations and we're keeping a, a close eye on that. We do some citizen science. People know me uh, as the tick lady. I get all kinds of interesting <laughs> phone calls, uh, which I enjoy. Um, I got you know, I got a tick, what do I do? Um, but they do tell me where they encounter ticks, and many of them are very reliable. So we have anecdotal reports of ticks at the Bloomingdale Bog, near Paul Smith's campus, Baker Mountain, um, and other areas, so we know that they are present, maybe not well-established populations at some of the higher elevation sites. And so we use this information to go there and actually try to document tick density and follow that. It's very, very patchy, so a systematic survey often doesn't yield good results. We really listen to local citizens and community groups and we say, where are you seeing ticks? Where are you finding them? And we go to those places. It's a, a bit of a public health approach, not so much an ecological approach. That's important too, but we really are interested in finding ticks in the patches where they are and, and seeing what pathogens they harbor. We're also in the process of creating some risk maps. Uh, we use a program called Maxent, which is very, very new to me as a training as a biomedical science, scientist. This is, this is way far removed from my expertise. And uh, Kurt is helping us and we're, we're interested in not only trying to map um, where the riskiest areas are in the park, but also how that risk will change with climate change, so doing some modeling there. And I have a former student who is very devoted to uh, creating some of these risk maps. So what have we found? Well, um, yeah, we do have some diseases here in these ticks. So the average infection rate is shown here on the slide for three of the most important uh, for us um, infectious diseases carried by them. Uh, we analyzed about 500 ticks from eight sites last fall, so these are the most up-to-date numbers you can get. So 64% uh, of ticks that we collected tested positive for Lyme disease, and the range was 42 to 85. Um, I've had physicians call me and say, I have a patient here with a tick bite, so how, what percent of ticks are infected? Like what, 1.5? I'm like, no, no, ha about half, and they're always quite shocked. So mm -hmm. that simple number that the physicians and other healthcare providers know really does inform what they do with their patients in the clinic. It's, it's a coin toss, so I tell people assume that they're infected with Lyme. If you have a tick bite, assume it's infected. Doesn't mean you always need treatment, but, um, but that, give that information to a, a caregiver, a healthcare provider um, if, you, if you get bitten. Um, we saw Babesia microti, this is a malaria-like parasite for the first time in 2016 in a site near the Clinton Essex County border and that was a big surprise. It seemed to have jumped up from, from uh, like the Crown Point area. It, it made a big jump. Um, then the next year we saw it distributed throughout the park. That was 2017 in about five sites. In 2018 it sort of retracted and we didn't see it uh, throughout the park but again only in that 
that one site near the Clinton Essex County border. Um, and I was chatting yesterday with the expert at the Department of Health, the vector ecologist, and she said, yes, it kind of, it's like a flame, it kind of flickers and sometimes it goes out and then it comes back on again. Um, so in the emergent areas, it's really interesting to watch how these diseases establish. But Lyme disease seems to always come first. And then anaplasma, we, so, but area-wide, we see an average of 9% of ticks have Babesia. That does cause a very serious human disease. It can, uh, something healthcare providers should know is here. Uh, and anaplasma, again, can be a very serious disease, and about 11% of our ticks now have that, where a few years ago we were seeing very, very low numbers. So the, the situation is definitely changing. This, last year, interestingly, we saw a very high co-infection rate at some of the sites, especially in Essex County. Um, about a quarter of the ticks were infected with more than one of these infectious agents, and 6% were infected with all three. So, you know, a tick bite can give you a lot of things, and you might be sick, and you might think you have Lyme and get proper treatment, but if you have Babesia also, you need a different treatment. So it's very, very important that our healthcare providers know of these things. And last fall, we, we did do our survey. We, we tried to do this monitoring. It's not long term yet, but uh, it's, we have five years of data now. Um, and before this, there was really very little. A, a few ticks were collected, a handful, and now we've, we have thousands that we've collected and studied now since 2014. Uh, last fall, we were told that there is no, um, no systematic study for Powassan virus. And you may be familiar with this. There was an outbreak. Um, an outbreak, it was three cases in 2016. Uh, another uh, small outbreak in 2017. There have only ever been 29 cases reported in New York since the early 2000s, so in like the past 20 years. So to have nine cases in the last two years shows a big increase. The reason why folks are so concerned about Powassan is whereas many of the infectious agents in ticks aren't transmitted within uh, immediately upon tick bite, the tick has to be attached for likely about 24 hours to transmit, so you have a bit of a grace period to find that tick and pull it off. Powassan virus is believed to be transmitted within 15 minutes. Um, the other bad news about this one is it's fatal in about 50% of cases. But the good news is, <laughs> the good news is there's no need for panic. Um, <laughs> um, it's very rare. Uh, the likelihood of, of getting Powassan virus, even if the tick is infected, is very low. If you get bitten by a, a tick infected with Powassan, your chances of getting Powassan virus are still pretty low. We think, but how do we know? Because only 29 cases have ever been reported. So we are keeping a close eye on Powassan virus. And our intent last fall, and we, we did a stellar job. We, we collected um, hunter harvested deer blood samples. So why, why deer blood? Uh, deer don't get sick from Powassan, but in an area where there are ticks, a deer may be bitten by thousands of ticks over the course of its life. And so they are walking sentinels. They are an incredibly sensitive way to determine if Powassan is out there in the landscape. So in many areas of New York, virtually all deer show signs of prior exposure to Powassan. Mm. But people aren't really getting sick. We still only see a handful of cases every year. So that's, that's the good news. Uh, in a few cases, they have found yeah. pockets of ticks that test positive, but usually you don't really find them. So a very, very low percentage of ticks, probably carry Powassan, the deer just gets bitten by so many that they're, they're very good. So we did a study. We actually uh, got deer blood samples from deer harvested from every wildlife management unit in the North Country. And believe it or not, I just got the results from that study. While I pulled into the parking lot, I checked my email, and there it was. And I haven't really had a chance to look. Um, but let's just say this. The story is interesting. And I can't talk about it yet. I do have an agreement with the Department of Health that I don't talk publicly about results until the county health department directors are informed. That's just good practice. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, I will be somehow communicating those results responsibly in the next few weeks. But I think um, the Powassan virus study is, is a very, it was a good one, it was timely, and uh, we have, we'll have some interesting results to share. So there we have it.
moving on to Kurt. <laughs> Let's all go out for a walk in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> so I always I love hearing what my colleagues are doing. It's all so impressive and there's so many things going on at the college now with the long term monitoring Celia was talking about and this human health stuff is really important and exciting too. Um, it raises the question of course, um, is climate change that we hear about happening all over the world actually happening right here in the Adirondacks? Because when you talk about the global average temperatures going up, it doesn't necessarily mean it's changing here. So um, basically I want to uh, reassure you um, in the simplest possible terms that yes, climate change caused by people is real. Um, it's caused by us. And uh, the focus of what I'd like to talk about today right here is, is that it's here as well. And so these concerns and interesting topics we've just been hearing about actually are relevant because warming is actually, climate change is really happening right here too. And uh, there's all kinds of really good evidence for this that's kind of hard to come by. It's not, you know, on the national news or something like that, this local scale kind of change. Local folks like us have to dig it up. Um, but if you talk to folks and uh, look for the information, it's there. So I'll show you some of the highlights. Uh, we've got six reputable, high quality weather stations here in the uplands of the Adirondacks. They're with the United States Historical Climatology Network. You can get their latest data off the web. Um, so it's freely accessible. Um, Lake Placid is one right here. Um, that's a graph of the temperatures of the last century, basically, uh, at Lake Placid, going from left to right. In here, you can see basically an overall warming trend uh, picking up especially after the 1970s, which is about when the human influences on the global climate also have really picked up from fossil fuel emissions and things too. So um, in the case of Lake Placid, the average temperature, if you take the whole year together, uh, has increased about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit in the last three decades or so. Um, so you know, what does that mean? Um, basically, that's faster than global warming. And uh, the other sites in the park, too, show similar changes, although some are even faster. Danamora has a faster change than that as well, almost twice the speed of global warming. So it's definitely happening here, there's no question, and it's uh, especially been picking up since the 1970s, shown by station after station. So um, what does that mean? Basically, uh, as far as the seasonal, seasonality effects go, like Celia was talking about, uh, winter is really the target season. Um, winters are shrinking. They're um, basically eroding away on both ends of the season. They, on average, and unlike this year, um, are starting later and ending earlier. Um, it's up to us to decide, based on what we know of where we live, whether that's a good thing or not. Um, it's, of course, always going to be a mixed bag of things in a complex place like this. So we were just hearing about uh, the deer and stuff, right? So milder winters could mean better survival of those tick-bearing deer and mice and things like that. Um, but you could also say maybe it's good for the deer herd if you're into the uh, hunting industry. Uh, of course, you know, shorter winters, less road salt, fewer road accidents, but also the cultural effects we have here. Uh, basically, uh, winter pretty much, I think, is one of the major things that defines the Adirondacks in uh, terms of who we are and where we live with the Winter Carnival and the Olympic heritage and the winter sports industry and all that kind of stuff too. So it's up to us basically to decide what this climate change stuff is going to mean, but uh, there's no question from the data we have here that it is actually happening on a scale at least as intense as the global average. So you can see this in the phenomena that we live in the midst of. And I think maybe one of the clearest ways to see this is if you've spent enough time here out on the lakes to notice that the ice story is changing on our lakes around here. And uh, what we've got over on this chart is uh, a timeline of the last 200 years from Lake Champlain that has been kept by uh, volunteers over the years, generation after generation for 200 years, um, measuring when the ice appeared 
on the main part of Lake Champlain, kind of between Plattsburgh and Burlington, where the ferry boats go. It's called the main basin. And uh, this chart, I ripped away the ups and downs of the dates and things like that, and I only left these little asterisks, because these are meant to mark off winters when the main basin of Lake Champlain did not freeze over at all in the winter. And so the first half of this timeline, which will go from left to right here, sort of has um, only in the, in the entire 1800s, there were only three winters, these right here, where the lake didn't freeze. So you kind of, if you're running it on and you made a melody out of it, you go ding, 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 and then you're going along and ding, ding, and then you're getting up to the present, ding, a ling, a ling, a ling, like that, mm. until basically it's unusual for it to freeze in the middle. So that's a pretty undeniable sign of warming in the winter seasons. We've got it on the lakes up here in the uplands too. Um, we have volunteer long-term monitoring people called folks who invest in ice out contests every year. We've got it at Lake Placid, Mirror Lakes got ice out contests at Paul Smith's. It was going on when I got there, 1987. It goes back to like 1970 or so. Uh, I've been maintaining it ever since uh, without making a contest out of it. And, uh, but basically uh, what we're seeing on Lower St. Regis Lake where Paul Smith's college is, is uh, since my personal data set started in 1988, um, freeze ups are coming almost two weeks later on average than they used to when I first came to Paul Smith's college. Hmm. And um, the ice out is happening earlier, uh, between one and two weeks earlier in the spring. So we're almost a month shorter ice season on average. You know, it varies from year to year, of course, but um, that's pretty undeniable. Um, and people, people keep good data when they're doing an ice out contest because there's money involved, right? <laughs> and they keep the data so they can predict what next year's timing is going to be, right? So these are really great sources. A lot of lakes have ice out contest data that show the same thing as this. So other people keep nature diaries. Um, either as a hobby or some folks do it, you know, Huntington Wildlife Forest, um, SUNY ESF has uh, data like this here at, the, at Paul Smith College. We've got nature data from the campus that go back to the late 1980s. And we do things like monitor, write down when the robins come back in the spring, when do the native bees come out of the ground on the south facing slopes, and when do the spotted salamanders migrate across the road on that first warm rainy night in spring. And uh, we've been keeping those records, and in all cases, of those three at least, um, these uh, migrations and appearances are coming up to two weeks earlier in the spring, which makes sense, and that matches the temperature changes as well. So there's evidence from long-term monitoring to show you that not only do the weather stations show you it's warming, but this kind of long-term monitoring shows you that it's having effects where we live too. So um, it also has important implications for economically valuable species. In the case of trout, they don't do so well in warm water as they do in cold water. Uh, recent research by scientists at Cornell University show that brook trout don't breed as well as they could otherwise as the streams warm. There's major concern um, being voiced by people in the Nature Conservancy here that lake trout are in trouble from the warming of the lakes as well. And um, that has actually management implications in the case of Fallensby Pond there over near Tupper Lake, uh, which has an amazing, you could say like a heritage population of gigantic lake trout. Uh, and that's because it's so deep, it's over 100 feet deep. And there's a lot of cold water refuge down in there. Um, one, of the, one of the goals of management of this lake in the future is to consider it a climate refuge for lake trout as well as a place that's likely to resist the effects of warming as lake trout are dying out in other lakes that don't have that deep cold water pocket in them. So um, if you're into gardening, you may have heard that uh, the USDA has changed the map of uh, hardiness zones for crops and plants and gardens and things like that to match the changes in the temperature. Um, so there's New York State with all the colored blobs on there, and it uh, has changed in recent years. Gardeners tell me that um, they've noticed that as well. And um, in addition to the temperature, of course, 
precipitation is part of the climate too, and that is changing as well. Since about 1970, there was a big jump in the amount of precipitation every year in the whole region, Lake Champlain and the Adirondack uplands. So it's like six to eight inches more per year in total. You can see that without graphs. Uh, I've got two pictures here from Bear Pond, which is over near uh, Paul Smith's near uh, Upper St. Regis Lake. A couple of canoe carries in from there. And uh, this is a picture I took of what used to be an island in Bear Pond. It's um, even got, Bob Stegman there, is there a DC? No camping sign <laughs> right there. Uh, and I can vouch that the sign wasn't that effective because I used to illegally camp there <laughs> with friends back in the 80s and got busted once. Uh, I don't do it anymore, and you can guess why. It's underwater. Um, if you look at the shorelines of lakes, this is also Bear Pond, and you may see this in passing if you're on one of your lakes. If tree roots are going down under the water, that means the lake level has come up. Trees don't take root underwater. That's more evidence that the shoreline is eroding and uh, trees along the edge might eventually drown and, and fall in. So this is basically, again, a result of climate change since about 1970. Uh, wetter Adirondacks in general there. So um, this has direct implications for people. If you remember the wet, super wet spring we had back in 2011 um, and it flooded Lake Champlain, um, it also flooded the ferry service. So uh, unfortunately for the folks who run the ferries on Lake Champlain, their offices are right on the shore of the lake. And so they had to go to work in rowboats for several weeks that spring to keep the ferry service going. And they gave me these photographs of what their thing looked like. This is the inside of their uh, work, their maintenance shed. There with uh, folks who had been working in rubber boots and then uh, waders and then hip waders and chest waders in the cold water um, to keep the ferry boats running. Um, one of the most interesting things about this, though, is that line of the water and the wall there. Uh, when the high stand happened, they drew a black line on the wall, and it's still there, and they put a date on it. Uh, what I saw when I went there and the water was gone was actually below that was another line from a previous high stand, and below that was another line from a high stand before that. It's been progressively, when these happen, they've been getting higher. So it's kind of like our own local version of sea level rise. When the storms happen, they're more intense. And when the wet spells happen, they're more intense. So you remember when Tropical Storm Irene came through? Uh, that's the backyards there in the town of Keene that used to be lawns and people's homes. Uh, basically, the river little stream jumped its banks and eroded that out. Uh, I went through the data from Danamora, took the daily rainfall uh, all the way back for 100 years and put a little dot on a timeline of the last century for every storm that dropped more than two inches of rain here. And as you can see, the average intensity of heavy rainfall has been going up, just like you expect for the global average about more intense storms. Um, so it's not that we're necessarily getting more storms, but the ones that we get that are large carry more water than they used to, and they dump bigger dumps, just like is happening globally. So um, I've got two more slides. That shows you that it's real and it's here. Uh, where is it headed? That's partly going to depend on what we do as a species around the world, how much more uh, greenhouse gas we emit. And uh, so the climate models don't always agree on every detail. But what they do agree on is the more fossil fuel we emit, the more intense the scenario will be. So this is basically averaged out from 16 different climate models for the region, the Champlain Adirondack region that I worked on for the Nature Conservancy. If we uh, cut back sharply from fossil fuels, probably the mildest scenario we would have by the end of the century is between one and six degrees Fahrenheit warmer. If we go ahead with business as usual and do the more extreme emission scenario and warm the planet more, then by the end of the century, it's six to 11 are the guesses from the climate models, especially in the winter. As far as the precipitation goes, it's, that's even harder to predict. It's a lot more finicky than temperature. There's a lot more that goes into it. In the mild case, maybe little or no change from what we've already seen. But if we go ahead with the intense emissions, you can see maybe another four to six inches per year in this century and then go on into centuries beyond that. So um, that's basically what I've got. And uh, thank you for listening to the three of us. We thought we were hoping we'd leave some time for questions or comments. Um, so, 
maybe my colleagues would come up here too and if you've got anything you'd like to ask us here we are So the naysayers out there often say, you know, it's, this is a blip. It happens periodically. In fact, I'm reading a book about um, the origin of skiing, and they're talking about in Norway back in the late 1800s how they had the glaciers were retreating and it was too warm to ski. And so, can you talk about that, that debunking that? And and the other thing I'd like to throw into that is man-made versus natural, like volcanoes and things like that, forest fires. And Could you just talk about how that all fits? Sure. Uh, there's no question that climate changes naturally. Uh, my specialty is studying natural climate cycles from ice ages to the sunspot cycles. So we can actually make a list of what those natural cycles are that make the warming go up and down. Uh, none of them are the right duration to match what's been happening in the last century. So it is not a natural cycle. The changes we are seeing now um, in like lakes up in the Arctic that are thawing now that have not done that for thousands of years. If it were a cycle, it would have happened over and over again. So there's list as long as your arm showing you why these are not natural cycles. There are a lot of different ways of showing that the greenhouse gases are definitely coming from us. Uh, anything from looking at the carbon isotopes in the CO2 to um, any of that kind of thing. Um, so it's, what was your question about the, uh, the first part, I mean your second part there when you said... Um, that other, maybe the other natural contributions. Yeah. If, if you looked at the trend line for other natural contributions like volcanoes. Yeah, like so, like right. So there are only three things that could change the whole global climate like this at this pace. Uh, one is the sun getting stronger or weaker. We've been monitoring that carefully for the last you know, century or, or so, and that's not doing anything unusual to explain the warming. Um, the other one is volcanoes. If they release carbon dioxide too, and they also release soot that shades and cools the planet. Um, they haven't been doing anything unusual since the 1970s. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we release more CO2 than 100 times all the world's volcanoes combined wow. right now. So we're a force of nature. Um, the only other thing that's been increasing that could change the whole global climate is greenhouse gases, and we know that we're doing that. So, and I should say this as a former climate skeptic, some of you may have known me back in the 1980s, because we didn't have all that information back then. Um, and I've changed my mind in the light of the information now. So. I had a uh, question for Dr. Sporn. The incidence of tick-borne disease in Dutchess County, mm -hmm. which was high, precipitously fell off and, as you say, rose in Essex. And it looked like from the slides that the biggest rise was along Champlain Valley, which is sort of in a way similar to Dutchess County farm country. Right. Is there any, is, is there a relationship there and why do you think it's falling down in, in one area and up in so, another yeah, that's similar? So yeah, it's interesting. I think very few people other than maybe me really target and you know, everyone has access to this data but I really look at the North Country and compare it to other areas. So I don't know if this trend is evident to other folks or not. I just sort of crunch the data that way. So it seems to me that that you know, why would there be a decrease in Dutchess County? And I chose that because there is a research institute there, and there are a lot of studies done there. So you really, you know, you trust that data. The Cary Institute, I believe, is Real there. Book, yeah. um, so a lot of studies are done there. Um, my personal hypothesis is that the disease is a bit different in emergent areas, and um, for example, the infection rate, exposure rate of dogs in Franklin County, right now, is some of the highest in the state. But we really don't have that many ticks here yet. So it, it seems as though perhaps the strains of Lyme disease that are here might be particularly virulent. And that's a hypothesis. We do have some a little bit of data to support that, but certainly nothing that we could publish. So the biology of the disease might be different. It seems to almost spread like a fire. It burns very hot, and then it kind of fizzles out, and it moves into a new area. So that seems to be the phenomenon that's happening. And the explanation it could be people are more aware in Dutchess County, and they're just protecting themselves 
from getting Lyme disease. They're, they're watching for ticks and pulling them off and using more repellents. I think there's something more to it than that. Um, but we don't know. There's very little um, grant money to support basic research in this area. And so we may never know the answer to that. But it's a phenomenon, I think you can't argue, that the emergent areas, as we are, are places that absolutely need to be watched. Thank you. But yeah, Dutchess County, the, the climate in the, is very similar to the Hudson Valley. You know, the, I mean, the Lake Champlain, Champlain. Valley. Um, it's warm. It's very much a microclimate there. The growing season is longer. It's, it's just suitable to habitat. Yeah. yeah? Thank you. Chad. Another question on that. Have you worked with veterinarians at all? They mm -hmm. are very often using dogs as a way to cats Absolutely. to find out where that spread is going. They yeah. do a lot of titers and trying to find out whether your pet actually has Lyme disease right. or not because they're more susceptible to us being there lower to the ground often than right. we are. So they're estimated to be about seven times, seven times more likely to encounter a tick than a human when you're out in the woods with your dog. Um, and they're often tested annually. We worked right next door with the, Raybrook, with the High Peaks Animal Hospital for several years. Um, one problem, though, the diagnostics, they can't really distinguish new infection from, from prior ex infection. It's kind of hard. They test positive, so it's sort of cumulative. Um, we even worked with the uh, veterinarian at Cornell University who has uh, a test that I wish they had for humans and they only have for dogs that can distinguish between new infection, like this season and prior. And we thought that would be a great way to track exposure rate here. Um, we didn't get enough numbers to really say, to see any trends. But it is interesting. There's a vaccine for dogs. Dogs are tested annually. Um, there's not a vaccine for humans, and people aren't tested annually. So it's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. But the veterinarians definitely provide um, incredible input into risk. In fact, if, if someone were to say, um, how do we know if Lyme is moving into our area? you know, the westward expansion. Like in uh, Northern California, there's some Lyme. Northern Arizona, now there's some Lyme. It is spreading westward. Uh, my idea would be to look at veterinary records because the dogs will show evidence of exposure years prior to humans. We've seen that up here. I've been watching. And there's a website maintained by a professional organization that plots almost in real time the incidence rates of exposure. Dogs don't have to get sick, but it shows exposure of dogs to, to all the different parasites, and you can plot it by county. And that's where I got the information that Franklin County, 30% of our dogs show exposure to Lyme. And that is some of the highest incidence in the state, more than in Dutchess County. And we know that Dutchess County has more, like threefold higher than in Dutchess County. Dutchess County has more ticks. They have Lyme too. So somehow it seems as though maybe the disease is a bit different. Maybe we're not studying one disease, but several. We call it all Lyme. So that's a lot of conjecture, but there's some very interesting things to explore. Well, I'm from Columbia County. Oh, you're from and, Columbia County. And I think the, I mean, that one is that, the highest in the state. We are the highest. And I just I sort of said to Terry, well, maybe we're not the highest anymore because all of us have been infected, so the numbers have just dropped <laughs> off. But, I mean, I've been infected. and, and The uh, problem I'm, with that is you can get reinfected. Well, I guess my question was when I was, I remember getting bit and I got tested and it showed negative. And, but I didn't give up because I started feeling it and enjoying something. Oh, right, the test And I went three months much. later and they said, well, you just got infected. So, and I knew it's I It's really had, hard to diagnose. So I guess my question that I, I always struggle with and that I talk to people um, about is just, I mean, how reliable are these, these tests? How long does it take now? And... I've been told don't get tested again because once you have it, you have it, it'll always show up, so it doesn't mean anything. Could you maybe talk oh, about boy. some of that? Oh, boy. And I always shy away from that uh, because I'm, I, I, it's such a complex topic, but I do know the tests, the tests are fairly unreliable, and that's not the fault of medical science necessarily as the nature of the disease. Um, your body doesn't always react by producing antibodies to the bacteria, and everyone reacts differently. And yes, the like, all of us in the room probably would test positive for antibodies to measles because we were all vaccinated and none of us have probably had measles. So it's that kind of thing. It's the antibodies, not a good indicator of whether or not you're sick. 
it just shows exposure, and even then there are false negatives and false positives. So it's a very tough <coughs> thing to diagnose, and people are incredibly frustrated for good reason. <laughs> we just get tested if we've had it every year as part of our annual. Physical. I don't think people. I don't think people do that, and honestly, I'm not quite sure why they do that with dogs. I'm kind of glad they do because it, it gives us information about the risk to humans, but. Um, I don't think there's any reason for people to be tested unless you are sick. Um, the bullseye rash is, you, if you have that bullseye rash and know you had a tick bite, you, you should never do anything further other than get treatment. Uh, the test, you might have that bullseye rash and test negative. And that happens quite a lot. So it's, it's a very messy diagnostic process and very, very frustrating. And there are you know, chronic conditions associated with Lyme. Lots of controversy about that. So I don't even try to, to delve in. I, I try to stay a little bit away from that because I'm, I don't keep myself completely up to date. I'm, I'm just going to go out and collect ticks and see where they are and what diseases they have, which is an important piece of information. Anybody else? We seem to be fixated on ticks, but I want to say that the, the long-term monitoring, I think a lot of us around this table, most of us I think is very important. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Steger, we, we really appreciate your coming and talking about the overall conditions and how it affects the Adirondacks. That's critical. We, Chad, go ahead. Can I ask you a question, uh, Dr. Steger? What do you see as terms of uh, climatic regime changes for the Northeast? We certainly can do extrapolations of individual things like rainfall and, and temperature and so forth. But when you get climatic regime changes, we've got situations like um, you're going to have these polar vortexes, you're going to have uh, the jet stream changing direction and so forth and, and, and being a different shape as it travels mm -hmm. around the planet. What do you hear as the conjecture on that? Yeah, so that's um, this thing about the polar vortex is referring to that big spinning air mass over the North Pole, and on the southern edges of that we have the jet stream, and it's literally a stream of air which can meander like a regular stream can do too. And so if it makes these loops, it can let cold air come down from the north or warm air bulge up from the south. And uh, when we get these wicked cold snaps in recent years, that's from a downward bulge of the jet stream from the edge of the vortex. So there, um, it's very hard to model and very hard to understand. There's pretty good evidence that a warming planet is likely to have a less stable track of the jet stream, in which case you'd expect wicked cold and then wicked warm, and it, it might even sit there for a long time if the loop gets stuck. So it doesn't change the global average temperature, but it sure wreaks havoc where we live. So um, it's not nailed down 100% yet, but it looks pretty good. Uh, it may be related to the retreat of ice up in the Arctic, or it could be the cause of the retreat of the ice up in the Arctic, bringing warm air up. And that's still kind of not decided yet in the scientific community. But uh, it's a good bet that we'll see more of that kind of thing. Paul? Yeah. Dr. Evans? <laughs> yes, Paul. <laughs> um, could you? Identify, or do you have any sense of um, where there's needs for more long-term monitoring, uh, gaps in long-term monitoring in the park, um, things that the state might do? Uh, you know, I, I couldn't answer that specifically. I'm sure that ESF is doing some great work. I'm not very familiar with what they're doing at ESF. Um, but at Huntington Forest, I'm sure there's some really great stuff being collected. What could the state do? I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I would say that I haven't looked at sort of all the different efforts, but there's, there's probably a fair amount in the Adirondacks based on the nature of the place and the importance of it ecologically in the Northeast and all of the organizations that work here and care about it. So I would guess... I would guess that relative to a lot of places, we're in pretty good shape in terms of people who are interested in it, thinking about it, and doing things about it. But I, I wouldn't be able to say that I knew um, all of the efforts that were going on, although that would be a really interesting project, which is to sort of find out, is to start to find out what are the data that are out there, who's collecting what, and uh, we can always use more synergy. <laughs> In our, in our organizations that all care about the same things than we tend to have. We tend to sort of silo. So that'd be cool. But I don't know the answer um, specifically. And some run out of money. I don't know, like Lake Survey Corp, oh, yeah. which has and, been and doing this for 25 years, almost 
you know, yep. camera crop or Bethesda. Yep, and Paul Smith also has been doing their ALAP monitoring for all of those years, and um, yeah, Corey and Dan at the Watershed Institute. So those two, like the water, the water data is is pretty solid for the Adirondacks, and then also down in Lake George, some Dar Darren Freshwater Institute. I mean, I I would say the water is pretty well covered in terms of changes in chemistry and temperatures. Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, I, I'm. I'm a fan of winter, and I do think winter's that tough season, and so a lot of the work that I do with looking at snow depths and changes, and I, I think that we can always do a lot more with winter ecology and try to understand, and that is our, that is our really crunch season. So it might be neat to be doing more with um, not just the start of the end of the snow um, cover, but things about depth and density. Those are the things about snow that are going to really influence a lot of our communities, those that have to walk through the snow, those that have to um, potentially live in the subnivian zone. So I think winter would be a neat place probably to identify as, as needing more long-term data for those things. You talk a lot about the temperature rising, et cetera. Um, but what, and again, this is just from my observation, it seems as though our storms, whether it's winter, summer, tornado, whatever, um, all of these things are becoming more intense. Is that is that just by or is that also part of climate change? That like yeah, climate, that's yeah. that's anti the more heat you put into the global climate, it's like a big machine. It's got more energy, more fuel, so things churn more and they have more moisture in them evaporating. So yeah, that's all part of the big picture, and we've definitely got it here uh, from the Danamora data. It's clear that uh, when you get something that's a big storm what you call a big storm now is bigger than what it used to be. Yeah. And I would say that ecologically, maybe more so than even the change, the gradual change, even though temperature matters for every living organism, so temperature is pretty important, but that fluctuation or that variance right now is one of the things that's most challenging for communities and organisms, even more so than just how much moisture and what the temperature is, but it's that fluctuation that is really hard on ecological systems. And I know you're a scientist and you spend all your time doing research, but do you no, spend doing okay research. do you <laughs> do you spend any time um, just with in terms of education and outreach um, to, to to an awareness because I, I almost feel it's like what we went through with invasive species, but this is uh, even on such a greater scale because it it you know it just feels as though it's knocking on the door in a way that even invasive species isn't. Um, but but what we've done is gone out and, and reached out to people with with just marketing campaign and radio broadcast. Is there anything you're doing or, or anything we can do to try to get that word out that people are aware of this and what they can do and, and that this is real? I mean, how many non-believers do we have out there? You know, what, what are we doing? Because that's got to be a part of this, this education and awareness. Well, I mean, that, that's our passion, too. We, we all do uh, things outside the classroom as well, as much as we can. I have a weekly radio show, and I give talks all over the region. Uh, right, these folks do. Um, what was that one about uh, giving scientific talks in local bars? What was that oh, called? Yeah, yeah. That? The, the Wild Center. Um, yeah, and the Wild Center yeah. set this up. I mean, the Wild Center. Stage, I never so. got invited to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, it's just something you have to keep at. You know, you do as much as you possibly can. And any time we can all hook up and help each other, uh, we collaborate with the Wild Center. I'm sure we'd be glad to collaborate with, uh, with any of you folks, too. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, the more you can do it, the more people you can reach. Yeah, because I guess we'd like to know, what is it we can do to help you? You know what you guys could do to help me? <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm on a bit of a lobbying campaign. So all my funding came from the New York State Senate Task Force for Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. And with the Senate majority shift to Democrat, um, it was a Republican initiative, and that task force looks as though it's probably going to go away, and I'm left with no funding. And so I'm, I'm lobbying the Senate Democrats now to uh, encourage them to maintain this task force. So I think uh, a letter from the park agency would be wonderful. And I do have a short list of senators that Betty Little's office is working really hard. She's been so supportive. So supportive, but she, of course, has, has less uh, control now and less influence. And so she, I do have a list of senators and their chiefs of staff. So I would, and if you have any suggestions about that or contacts, 
it has become a bit of a lobbying. Send those to now. Karen. She knows just what to do with those. <laughs> Seriously? Mm -hmm. Okay. That be that would be great. I have all sorts of things that I could send to you, and and a, and your support on that would be would be important. So I think we do have to involve our legislators in ensuring that we have appropriate public health support up here to deal with this. And right now, I really truly feel as though we don't. Uh, outreach does cost something and so where do the funds come to do the radio broadcasts and do things so the Senate was supporting that and uh, I'm hoping they can continue. Well and we also have several representatives from our environmental groups here and I don't know if you've yeah. spoken to them. I haven't. But, I haven't. Uh, but we, it's, this is definitely the time. Um, I really am looking this summer at a budget of zero dollars um, and this is a time when I think you'll see the Powassan results. It's a time when um, we really need to be very closely watching this. And so I, I'm sure there's money out there, but uh, right now I don't have it. So um, yeah, I was sort of counting on the task force. I had a budget line there, and I thought I was going to be set. It's, we don't need a lot of money either. It's really not an expensive thing to do. So, so I, any, any help would be greatly appreciated. And I think I just want to say one more thing. We came here, I think, hoping to share, delighted to share what we knew, but also to um, be a resource and so I don't know how we can be a resource for the agency yeah. but how else we can be a resource for all you other groups out there you know partnering and sharing we don't we really don't do enough of it we have a lot of silos and it, you know money is tight and it's hard to do it sometimes and egos get in the way I think that's a real honest appraisal of what happens a lot of the time because it's a small we really live in a very small pond and we all really care about the same stuff and so we're always trying to often keep our piece of whatever that pie is. But I think the best way to do these things is to is to work together and find ways to make that work for everybody. And uh, maybe we always preach this, but I absolutely believe that we should be able to, in a place like the Adirondacks, where we all care about the same thing, <laughs> be less dysfunctional than we really absolutely are. So there you go. I got to go see my daughter ski at Van Hope. <laughs> Oh, there's still snow. <laughs> That's um, such an important point in, in terms of how we can work together collectively. I mean, last year we heard, you know, the intergovernmental report, the panels, what they're saying, the UN scientists, what they're saying, the Black Friday report that came out on Black Friday that didn't really, you know, got hidden. And, you know, there's such extremes in, in terms of what the cost to society will be in the hundreds of billions. and. We're here in the Adirondacks, and you are making a difference with the work that you're doing. Um, and I think if we could look at collaborations and where there's involvement with our, our RAS division here at the agency, and, and, and really having some broader forum to, to, to get the message out. So thank you so much for your perspective today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's great. Just yet. Okay. We have a little something for you as a thank you for your presentation today. Cecilia, if you all can just come up real quick, you got a minute before. <laughs> We have a um, presentation, a certificate of appreciation. There you go. Yeah, I'll take a picture. You can have the frame. I thought it was still you. I have to turn my name. All right, one, two, three. We all have Where's to. Where's Kurt? This is Kurt. Kurt, you mean the middle? Come on, Kurt. Oh, we get to get in. Jeff, just here. Hold on a second. Okay, right there. One, two, three. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. 